Mr. Chairman, members of the Finance Committee, ladies and gentlemen. North Carolinians for Tax Reform and the many groups and individuals across the state who support its objectives ask your support for Senate Bill 535, the bill to remove the tax on food. The purpose of this bill is to remove a tax that's both unwise and unjust and replace it with other taxes that are wiser and fairer and will recover the revenue that would otherwise be lost. In short, it does not propose any increase in the overall tax burden of the state, and it does not propose any reduction in state revenues. What it does propose is the removal of a tax on some of the most basic necessities of life, a tax which falls most heavily on low and middle income families, and the shifting of this tax to luxury items and to citizens who benefit most from our economic system and who are best able to pay taxes. We believe the present sales tax on food is both unwise and unfair. It's unwise because it's completely inflexible. It's like a tax on breathing. You can't avoid breathing, you can't even postpone it, and you can't avoid eating, and you can't postpone it. If you're laid off or working short weeks, you and your children can't postpone eating until the paychecks start coming in again. Yet every time you or your children open your mouths to eat a bite, North Carolina's tax collector says, stop, pay me first. Past sessions of the General Assembly have had the wisdom to see that there should not be a tax on a doctor's services or the drugs he prescribes or on hospital charges. Why not? Because they have seen that these are necessities of life and the General Assembly has cared about the health and physical well-being of North Carolina citizens. But have you ever stopped to consider that this same logic applies equally to the tax on food? Food is as essential to good health as a doctor's services. It's a vital form of preventive medicine. Why should it be discouraged by taxes? We believe that there's a better right way to raise the hundred million dollars North Carolina's tax collector currently takes in at the dinner tables of citizens around the state. Part of it can be recovered by putting a somewhat higher tax on one of the most non-essential commodities known to man, namely alcoholic beverages. Senate Bill 535 also proposes to recover some of the lost revenues from the food tax by increasing the tax on luxury automobiles, yachts, and private sports planes. Currently, these have a very special privileged position in our state's tax laws. The tax rate is only 2% on such items, and to add insult to injury, there's a $120 ceiling on the tax, so that if a wealthy person buys a $300,000 sports plane, he pays no tax at all on $294,000 of the purchase price. And this goes on while bread is taxed at 3 and 4 percent. In effect, what this means is that low and middle income groups are being compelled by law to subsidize the luxuries of the rich. We tell these folks to eat less or eat less wholesome foods so some wealthy business or professional man can indulge himself and buy a new Cadillac or yacht. Where is the justice in that? North Carolina is the only state in the Union that sets a ceiling on luxury commodities, on the tax on luxury commodities of this kind. A third source of revenue Senate Bill 535 proposes to tap is income received in the form of dividends from North Carolina corporations. This is another case of special privilege. Unlike income that a mill worker earns by the sweat of his brow, this unearned income is not taxed at all. It's not even taxed at the lowest rate on our income tax schedule. And make no mistake, the beneficiaries of this special privilege are wealthy people. The report of the Special Senate Commission on North Carolina Revenue Laws, chaired recently by Senator Kirby, provides facts and figures on this subject. We learn from this report that people in the eight to $10,000 income bracket report only $11 apiece in deductible dividends. That means that on the average they're saving about 50 cents a year because of this provision of our tax code. By contrast, people whose adjusted gross income is in the $600 to $700,000 bracket report more than $46,000 each in deductible dividends, which means an average saving of more than $3,200 to each of these people. 
To put it differently, one of these people gets as much benefit from this special privilege as 6,500 citizens in the eight to $10,000 bracket. I just heard recently of a single individual with more than $500,000 a year income from dividends from North Carolina corporations, all untaxed. So once again, we have low and middle income people subsidizing the rich. Finally, Senate Bill 535 proposes to recover lost food tax revenues by increased taxes on top-level incomes. At present, our North Carolina income tax provides for the same flat 7% rate on all income above $10,000 a year. The rate doesn't change even if you earn well over a million dollars a year, as 36 North Carolinians did in 1971. This provision of our tax laws has not changed since 1937, even though inflation has made a $10,000 income something less than an upper-level income in 1975. Senate Bill 535 helps to restore the progressive character to our income tax, to make it more like it was a generation ago. It proposes to tax incomes at the $30,000 or $50,000 levels at a higher rate than incomes at the eleven dollars or $12,000 level. Yet this increase in the income tax, when taken together with the elimination of the food tax, will not hurt middle-income North Carolinians. On the contrary, they'll come out ahead. Let me explain. Take, for example, an average family at the $22,500 a year income level. Some people would say that's more than a middle-level income, but never mind. According to figures provided by the Kirby Commission report, this family will, on the average, have exemptions and deductions amounting to nearly $6,000. Thus, their taxable income will be approximately $16,500. Under Senate Bill 535, they would be required to pay 1% more in income tax on their top $1,500, making a tax increase of just $15. If they were an average family at that income level, they would also have $377 in deductible dividends, which would become taxable under Senate Bill 535. That would be taxed at the 8% rate and add $30, $30 to their income tax, making a total of $45 added. But if this were a typical family at this income level, they would save $50 in the state food tax and another $16 in the county food tax. Thus, even these people with this high income would come out $19 ahead, and they'd stay ahead unless they drank an awful lot. Families with incomes of less than $22,500 a year, or the real middle-income families of the state, would do even better. There's another even more surprising feature of this bill that we think you should give close attention to. Overall, this bill promises to shift 15 to $25 million of the federal tax burden of North Carolinians to citizens of the other 49 states. How is that possible? It's possible because Uncle Sam allows us to deduct state income and sales, in sales taxes from our federal income tax. The higher the tax bracket of those who take these deductions, the bigger the benefit to the individual and to the state. If a married man with a taxable income of $44,000 adds some extra deductions to his federal income tax return, he'll get 50% of these extra deductions back. If he's in the $200,000 bracket, as several hundred North Carolinians were in 1971, he'll get 70% back. But when the state taxes low and middle income people heavily, not much of this comes back from Uncle Sam. Most of these people simply take the standard deduction, and so it doesn't matter how much they pay in North Carolina taxes. They wouldn't get any more back from Uncle Sam even if you abolished both the income and sales taxes. Other low and middle income people list their deductions, but since they're in the lower tax brackets, they and the state only get 15 or 20 percent back. My best guess is that Senate Bill 535 will put an extra 15 to 25 million dollars into the economy of North Carolina because of this provision of the Federal Internal Revenue Code. I challenge you to find an easier way to pump this sum of money into the pockets of the citizens of this state without curtailing state services in any way. 
This is somewhat like revenue sharing, except it's the General Assembly, not the Congress, that has the power to do this for the citizens of North Carolina. Taken together, this bill will be a financial benefit to at least 90% of the citizens of the state. 90%. Perhaps more. Almost every family with an income of less than $20,000 should come out ahead, and some with incomes of $25,000 and more will come out ahead, too. It will not be often in this session that you ladies and gentlemen will have such an opportunity to help so many of your constituents. If you run again for public office next year, you could point with pride to your support of Senate Bill 535, and it should be worth some extra votes. Let me say a brief word now about three arguments you sometimes hear from critics of this bill. First, some say the food tax must be retained because everyone should pay something to support our government, and the food tax is the only tax some people pay. That's nonsense. If a person buys clothes, or shoes, or tools, or toys for his children, the tax collector takes his cut. If you own a house, you pay a property tax directly. If you rent, your landlord passes it on through the rent payments. And you also pay the personal property tax. If you drive a car to work, you pay several kinds of taxes. So please, let's bury the myth that anyone escapes taxes in North Carolina today. And more than that, the Kirby Commission report shows that the lowest income groups actually pay a higher percentage of their income, a higher percentage of their income in state and local taxes than those of us who are more well-to-do. The second argument I'd like to rebut is one that says that Senate Bill 535 is a fine bill, but this just isn't the right time to enact it. North Carolinians for tax reform say, on the contrary, this is the perfect time for it. We're in the middle of the worst depression since the 1930s, but it's a very strange depression. While millions of Americans are out of work, and millions more are struggling with reduced incomes because of short work weeks, a considerable number of Americans never had it so good. Every month lately, I read in the newspaper that the Cadillac division of General Motors has set a new sales record, and they can't turn out the new Cadillacs to meet the demand. And the same is true of most other businesses that serve the carriage trade and the country club set. Just last week, I read that first quarter profits for all the stock brokerage houses on Wall Street combined were the second highest in history. In short, while this depression is driving millions of Americans up against the wall, the more affluent segments of our nation aren't doing too badly. Senate Bill 535 gives you a chance to respond to these alarming conditions, gives you a chance to spread the burden of this depression, which is not the fault of anyone, but least of all those who are unemployed and on short hours. Third, we sometimes hear that taking the tax off food would create an impossible situation for grocers. Some of their products would be subject to the sales tax and some wouldn't. Lines at the checkout counter would grow a mile long, or grocers would have to hire extra help and that'd raise the cost of food. This is an easy argument to answer. Prior to 1961, grocers in North Carolina handled this problem with no great difficulty. Those were the days when North Carolina had a sales tax, but exempted food. More than that, two-thirds of the people of this country live in states that exempt food food from the sales tax. If grocers can handle a problem in Florida, Kentucky, Texas, and many other states, they can do it in North Carolina. Let me close by pointing out that next year will be the bicentennial of the American Revolution and this country's independence. One of the important issues in the Revolution was taxes and whether they were fair and just. You may recall the Boston Tea Party. I don't know whether you ladies and gentlemen have given any thought to the question of how the General Assembly might best commemorate this country's birth, but I'd like to propose that you could find no more fitting way to do this than by passing Senate Bill 535 that would serve so many of the people of this state so well and would help to restore faith in the proposition that ours is a government for the people. And this would be a fine memorial to you, the men and women of the 75-76 session of the General Assembly. It's something you could point to with pride for years to come. When your grandchildren ask you someday, granddaddy or grandmummy, what did you do when you were in the General Assembly? You will be able to say, well, I was one of those who voted to abolish North Carolina's shameful tax on food. 
used to be that a poor man in this state paid taxes on his children's bread and milk so that rich men would have more money for all kinds of luxuries. I helped to rid North Carolina of that tax. You will read about it in your history books when you get to high school. Mr. Chairman, members of the Finance Committee, don't miss this opportunity. Please give your vigorous support to Senate Bill 535. Thank you. Asked to sit and to wait in that unemployment line with the rest of our fellow workers and see and feel and taste what it's like to be without a job. Maybe, just maybe, they'll do something to put all America back to work like it ought to be. And maybe, just maybe, we'll begin to turn this situation around. And we can work together with you in the A. Philip Randolph Offensive to make sure that the goods and services that we are produced are shared fairly by all who produce them. That maybe we'll have a country in which there is really economic justice and the corporations and the rich will not get off scot-free in terms of paying income taxes like they've been getting off. And if this happens, then we can bring together the have-nots and the have-littles and make a country in which there's racial equality, economic justice, and social democracy for all Americans. That's the kind of politics that we try and practice together with you in our combined program, the A. Philip Randolph Institute program, that works together with you and COPE. It's called the politics of solidarity, the politics of struggle, where A. Philip Randolph said that there were no reserved seats at the banquet table of nature. One gets what one takes and keeps what one holds. And so I hope that you use this conference today to keep on with the keeping on. Thank you very much. Dan, before you, Dan, before you go, let's get this. Norm just told you about this article. I showed it to him. One of the people from the Central Labor Union in Gastonia brought it to me. For those of you who are not familiar with labor history, in particular North Carolina labor history, I'd like to tell you that back in the early 30s when they had the general textile strike in this state, and there was a large strike at the textile businesses in Gastonia, and it got so vicious that the companies moved the workers out of the mill houses, and they went out into a tent city camping out on a farm to live. And while they were out there one Saturday night, the chief of police came out there intimidating them, about half drunk kicking him around and somebody shot him in the back and killed him. And since that time, Gastonia has been one of the most anti-labor areas, not only in this state, but in the entire nation. But uh, we've recently, last year, chartered a central labor union up there. And with what few unions we've got there, we've been right active. And they brought me a copy of the Gastonia Gazette uh, earlier, a couple of weeks ago, and I'll read you what Norm was talking about. The Gaston legislative delegation urged business leaders to, quote, get off their backsides, unquote, and lobby in Raleigh this session for their own interests. The advice came at a Monday meeting with the legislative committee of the Gaston County Chamber of Commerce after several businessmen expressed concern over the growing influence of Wilbur Hobby, state F of LCIO leader. Businesses are getting out hustled by the labor group, said State Representative Carl Stewart of Gaston. He said that many legislators, particularly in the East, owe their re-election to Hobby's influence. Senator Marshall Rouch of Gastonia agreed that Hobby can influence the outcome of many elections due to the widespread support labor groups can muster. I told a textile group last week that they needed a full-time lobby in Raleigh, Rout said. I told them that they'd better get off of their backsides and get to work. And the article goes on to tell about the rest of the story. This recognition, while the newspaper attributes it to Wilbur Hobby, is due to the work that you people are doing in the local unions 
and in the local central labor unions. Because Wilbur Hobby can't elect anybody in the East because he votes in Durham County. But it's you people who are doing the COPE work and the legislative work there that the legislators in Gastonia are worried about. And they have a right to be worried because with our new computer program acting at only about 50% effective uh, in the last general election, we had tremendous successes both on a statewide level where we elected five of the six congressmen that we endorsed, including the unseating of two of the most anti-labor congressmen who sat in Washington. We had the fact that we defeated proposition number two, which they thought was going to go over overwhelmingly when we were one of the few groups in the state opposing it and the governor and the lieutenant governor and practically every member of the legislature was supporting it. Also the fact that so many of our candidates in the state legislature were elected from the eastern part of the state and not only from the eastern part of the state, from the central part of the state and from the western part of the state. But due to the fact that we are in this type of situation we've had here, that come over this General Assembly and overly cautious, overly cautious attitude, which is very damaging to our program. Plus the fact that the Speaker of the House pointed the most anti-labor person in the House to head up the Labor Committee and then stack the committee 11 to 3 against us. So we really got our job cut out for us. And if we don't get the legislation passed, what we're going to try to do is give you the record of those people so when it comes up next November, they'll know why they don't have the COPE endorsement in their district. Now what I want to do at this moment, the Speaker of the House, I mean the Chairman of the Manufacturing and Labor Committee has given the Commissioner of Labor an opportunity to appear before his committee he then gave me the opportunity to appear before his committee, and then he invited one of the most anti-labor proponents in the whole South, a man that teaches anti-labor union, anti-labor activity to the business corporations of not only, when we get that thing right, y'all leave it alone next time. Uh, anti-labor and he came down and testified only for about 15 minutes and I think it's important enough because we stuck a tape recorder up in front of his face while he was testifying and uh, they thought it was a newspaper man they really didn't know it was the labor movement because Arnott Walker our legislative intern who's working with us from one of the universities uh, set it up there but I'd like to play for you if I might that 15 minute presentation made by the industry spokesman before we go into the rest of our legislative program. Right to work. The next items deal with something that concerns you the most and concerns us in industry too. Changing of the tax base or in any way making it more difficult for business to remain competitive and attain profits. Strange as it seems, few people outside of business and industry have any idea what corporate profits are, and it's shocking to us in the field when we find junior high school students have a better concept than many of their teachers. In any event, with profits in delicate balance and ranging from under 1% of the sales dollar in meatpacking and some other food-related industries in this state, on up to 11% at the very top in some operations, such as beer bottling, and averaging across the board only 4% to 4.25%, we would caution that any new taxes you impose or any new structures you design might well have a real and significant effect of that delicate balance. Unfortunately, an extremely high percentage of industry located in North Carolina is low value added, and with some most notable exceptions, such as cigarette manufacture, tends to be labor intensive as opposed to capital intensive. 
Therefore, competition is that much stronger for those located here. Competition not only from similar businesses located within the state or in other states, but also located abroad. Thus, any tax adjustment should carefully consider what the ultimate impact will have on profitability of the base of North Carolina's industry. We know the attempts to phase out inventory taxes. We know the complaints about intangible taxes, food taxes, and income taxes. And we can appreciate the need for reviewing all taxes from time to time. But we do urge caution, study, and careful analysis of the final impact. We would commend you for your steps you've already taken in changing the unemployment compensation requirements, most especially that pertaining to people who are trying to improve themselves while taking advanced work at the same time they're working. <coughs> Pardon me. To penalize them by blocking their eligibility for unemployment compensation was totally unfair and we appreciate the speed with which you rectified this oversight. An area of much concern to all of us as taxpayers and citizens is this matter of public employee unionization. Naturally, the professional trade unionists want public employees unionized, and they want to bargain for these employees. The last figures we've seen on the subject provided by the State Department of Labor for the month of December showed 150,900 employees in state and local education and another 114,100 working for state and local government. That comes to 265,000 people the unions want to recruit. And even at $5 per month in union dues, which is a low figure at today's going rates, that's a potential market or revenue source of $1,325,000 per month, or something like $159 million per year. So they're all a plum well worth plucking. And here I, I would digress also to read something we got in the bulletin this morning, does not pertain to North Carolina, but indicates what a similar uh, a right to work state has, has considered in these same matters. The answer to legalized collective bargaining for public employees is still no in Virginia. Since 1970, Virginia legislators have been offered many and various bills to legalize collective bargaining for public employees. This year, six bills were introduced and all six received the same fate killed in committee. This just came in this morning. Uh, I think here we we have a, a booklet that I'd like to have uh, the members have, members of the committee have. This is a booklet that we put out uh, about three years ago and it's still pertinent today. The statistics quoted in there are as of 1970 and we are in the process of updating those statistics. But as far as our reasoning, we think as outlined in this booklet, is as sound today as it was then. And now to continue, but we sincerely hope you do not panic or fall for collective bargaining pleas until you are convinced that unionization of public employees will in some way increase product productivity, lower costs, or in some way help the taxpayer get better government for existing costs. Our friends in labor relations in and out of government in northern states and far western states keep reminding us, quote, you people in North Carolina don't know how lucky you are, unquote. We, we hope most sincerely that you do not lightly toss away a good relationship and a feeling of cooperation, mutual support, and respect that government employees at all levels have enjoyed here and create through the guise of collective bargaining the late labor versus management strife our sister states have experienced in recent years. And here, again, may I digress and say that those of us that spend all our time in employee industrial labor relations realize that unions are most likely to get into a company or into a government uh, entity when the employer is not meeting the needs of the employee, either the, the psychological needs or the physical needs. They're not 
paying them the wages they should. They're treating them in a negative manner. They're not providing a, a, an atmosphere that's conducive to a good working relationship between the employer and the employee. And we think this is, is uh, totally necessary. Otherwise, the employee needs and does then have a right for third-party representation. We have had an opportunity to look at a bill recently introduced, House Bill 132, and sponsored by Representatives Long, Messer, Huskins, Hunt of Cleveland, Johnson of Wake. And the short title of the bill is State Personnel System. And we've looked it over. And although we might at a later date reserve comment on certain minor items, but we see this as a as what almost could be, in a, in a um, popular sense, be called a, a state bill of rights for, uh, for state employees. Because in it, it guarantees a, a good, sound, workable grievance procedure, something where the employee has recourse beyond and above the first line of supervision and gets full airing uh, at a hearing of their uh, complaints. We would, in business and industry, strongly support this bill uh, that has been introduced. Going back to my earlier comments about economics and understanding of business, we have not had a chance to look at Senator Mooney's bill, S-126. However, from what we see of the almost total lack of knowledge about free enterprise and basic economics are all about, we urge you to give serious consideration to rectifying this educational shortcoming in our state. And finally, in another educational area, we continue to have a problem with young people dropping out of school, having little to offer a prospective employer in the way of skills, training, or interest, and unfortunately, even too many high school graduates whose mathematical and communication skills are so woefully weak that they are seldom trainable beyond the most basic jobs. Therefore, we'd urge you to continue to push for meaningful alternatives to the so-called college preparatory courses offered and encourage the evolution of trade and industrial education, particularly if it is applicable to the community or area in which these young people reside. For example, there's not much sense in teaching, say, furniture and woodworking skills in a county 100 miles from the nearest furniture plant. But as industry grows and increases in most areas across the state, surely significant gains can, can be made in preparing these youngsters who otherwise might well drop out of school for something that interests them and for something they can enjoy in life's work. And that gentleman ends my formal statement. I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have on any of these things. Any members of the committee have any questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Mark, Mr. Dow, do you uh, see, uh, are they, do you know of uh, many inquiries and investigations of the higher skilled industries that might be interested in our state at this time? I and mean, what's the, what's the part? I think that uh, sort of covers it about, about as much as we want to cover that part of it today. Some of the questions there, one of them in particular, I think, was an attempt to, to justify the the fact that they're not going to do as much on unemployment compensation as we want them to do. What they're saying now that there's already five states whose unemployment compensation system has gone bankrupt. When you read this, I don't want you to get worried about a bankrupt system because it doesn't mean that the workers won't get any more money what it does mean is that the state will have to borrow, or this fund will have to borrow from the federal fund and then pay it back at a later date. We are not in that category of any danger of our fund going bankrupt. We've got an entirely different philosophy and different uh, tack down here. We're fixing it so the workers go bankrupt. 
because they don't get enough funds to live on. We are the second lowest in the average amount of uh, unemployment compensation of any state in the union, being by only Mississippi being behind us, in spite of the fact that we got our unemployment compensation lifted up last year to a maximum of $90, we're now discovering that there was some hanky-panky in that part of the law, which allows people who drew as much as $42 under the old law to draw as little as 34 for the same amount of money that they made when they were under the old law of $64. And we're reading about 12 different amendments. And I, I got one that I want particularly those of you who come across this kind of a treatment in your locality because it's left up to people in localities. Our unemployment compensation law says if you are put out of work and you go down and file for unemployment compensation, that if they send you out on a quote suitable unquote job, that you must take that job or else you forfeit your unemployment compensation. And they leave the word, quote, suitable, unquote, to the hearing officers in that area of the state. And most of these hearing officers rule that this means if you don't take any job that they offer you, that you forfeit your unemployment compensation give you an example of that in the eastern part of the state where we have a sheet metal worker who makes six dollars and a half an hour and he's out of work now and he goes down and files for unemployment compensation and they send him to an employer that pays two dollars and a quarter for non-union sheet metal work and because he doesn't take that job at two dollars and a quarter he is knocked out of unemployment compensation. Now bear in mind that if he don't go to work at all because of the fact he made the good wages he made under the union contract, and that's what his unemployment compensation is figured on, this man would draw two dollars and a quarter an hour from unemployment compensation. So what they're asking him to do is to go work for the same thing that his insurance would provide and he wouldn't have to have all the wear and tear on his automobile and his gas and oil getting to the job and the other things that are necessary. So in this case, they rule suitable employment is the same thing that he could draw on unemployment compensation. And so as you go around the legislature today, and in the future days that you're lobbying with your legislative representative, you ought to raise hell about the interpretation of the word suitable, because we're going to try to do one of two things in this respect. We're going to try to get a guideline from the Employment Security Commission stating what suitable means so that it won't be interpreted by these little fellows who are intimidated by the large corporations in their area, or else we're going to try to get legislation to define suitable. And by definition, I mean if an employee is sent to a job making over 25% less than he was making before, and in this case, the man's being sent down to make 200% less than he was making before, one third of what his, his union wages would be, then that they don't have to take that job and they don't uh, have to be disqualified from unemployment compensation. So that's one of the things that we're going to show you. Just to show you a little bit more, and I was really walking around and trying to get ready for the next thing, they passed out, it's Ed Dowd, who's the president of what they call Piedmont Industries, which is the anti-labor group of industries in the central part of the state, they passed out some agency shop material, one of the brochures I just passed down to Isle to be passed among you. I wrote off or called Washington and had somebody pick some of these up and mail them to me after he gave them out Thursday afternoon. 
And in that brochure, if you look on the back, it says you can order an anti-agency shop kit. Well, I had the guy pick up about five of these kits, and we want to just show you briefly what they put in these uh, agency shop kits because we're going after agency shop in this session of the legislature. This is the top of the brochure, and Dan, you're too close because after you get away from there, you're not going to pick up this stuff. Go ahead and switch it now. This is just the outside of the kit. Sure, I just passed out to you. Unionism and the classroom teacher against the organization of teachers unions in the state. enforced it, it would be illegal. 
But if we do as we want to do and change the law that we've got in, it will not be illegal. It will be lawful. And they got a few union members that oppose the union shop. Got one here, Arnold from Grayson Johnson in Springfield, Virginia, a railroad employee who's been a free rider all his life. Or thought wanted to be a free rider, but he he's in a railway union where the Railway Labor Act makes them join the union because they got union shop. And he's against it, against paying dues. Polls show public not deceived by phony free rider arguments, and they quote a public opinion survey here. Uh, which is now nine years old. In 1975, they're quoting a survey that was made in January of 1966. They're really up to date. And they talk about the union free riders. And that's you people that don't do work when you're paid to do the work in the plant. All right, Dan, that's good enough. Chris, you ready? I could comment on that, but I won't. Do what? Shouldn't be, it's off. It stopped, I'll believe you might be right. Chris Scott, the research and education director who we recommended for appointment on the Lieutenant Governor's Commission on Study for of Taxes in the State of North Carolina has been doing the liaison workforce with the various tax committees. I'm gonna call upon Chris to give you a rundown of the uh, tax reform legislation now before the legislature. Thank you, Wilbur. I, I guess that's going to go on like that, no matter what we do. Some, some days ago, maybe a week ago, the Greensboro paper ran a, an editorial, and the editorial was entitled a time bomb well what i'm handing out or having jack ward and some others hand out charlie hobby is that time bomb and what the time bomb is 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 an, is an analysis of who pays how much can, can you turn on the light in the back he said they just burn out i just tried to Got John working on it. We're working on it, but they're burnt out or they're confused. Maybe John maybe It's the switch, and we're trying to fix it. Maybe you want to move over here, Joe. Well, the time bomb is that wealthy folks in North Carolina are not paying their fair share of the taxes, and poor folks in North Carolina and working folks in North Carolina are carrying them on their backs. And this is a table that was developed by the Special Senate Commission on Revenue Laws. And you might want to look at what your particular tax bracket or your particular net taxable income is paying in state and local taxes. You've heard of the bottom line. Would you look down to the, the bottom line that's underlined? On, under assumption A and C, which are the really the, the important assumptions, it points out that where the very poorest people are paying almost 25 percent in their, in their taxable, net taxable income in state and local taxes, the richest people are paying 5 percent. Now what's important is that we knew that we were getting had all along, but finally we've got the tangible proof in front of us. The Senate's commission has, has entered the evidence, and they can't deny it. I've told some of you before that I'm not an economist, and I'm proud of that because
someone once said that an economist is someone, if you, he once said that if you laid all the economists in the world end to end, they couldn't reach a conclusion. Well, let me tell you, I can reach a conclusion. The conclusion I reach is that the state senators and the state representatives don't really want to change the tax picture that you see on this table. They're satisfied that poor people pay more and rich people pay less. And I think maybe the most instructive thing you can do today is when you go to the legislature this afternoon, get on the elevator and push the button for the basement. And in the basement is where they park the cars, the state senators and state representatives park their cars and walk around and see how many Pintos and how many Volkswagens and how many inexpensive cars there are down there and then count up the number of LTDs and Lincoln Continentals and Cadillacs and you can figure out exactly why it is that they're satisfied to take this information and do nothing with it. Well one of the most important elements in this regressive tax picture that you're looking at now is the sales tax on food and you've all heard Wilbur talk about it for years it's nothing new to us. We know it's a bad tax. Finally, we know just how bad it is. We know that it hits the poorest people 50 times harder than it hits the rich people, the wealthiest people. 50 times harder. This is a country in which when I went to school anyway, when I was in, in grade school and, and junior high school, people talked about progressive taxes. Well, you can say, well, okay, maybe the sales tax is regressive. What about the income tax? That should be progressive. Well, look up one more line from the sales tax on food, and you see the income tax analyzed. Now, in this state, you have a table, a tax table for incomes that goes from 1% up to 7%. People who earn a taxable income of over $10,000 in this state are supposed to be paying 7% on that income. But when you account for the fact that the very wealthy can deduct their state taxes from their federal taxes, you'll see that the very wealthiest people are paying less than 2% in income taxes. So that not even the progressive income tax is really progressive to any great extent. North Carolinians for Tax Reform is a coalition. It's a real coalition because we've got groups in it like the Christian Action League, like the NAACP, like the Council of Churches, like Common Cause, a whole gathering of groups who have decided to tackle this tax question. And we're not only in favor of repealing the food tax, but we're in favor of making up the rest of the lost revenue to the state. We really are in favor of real tax reform, not, not the kind of tax reform that Governor Holshauser has called for, because we know that the services that the state provides are important, that it's important for teachers and, and other state employees to get a decent wage. So we need to make up the money that would be lost by eliminating the food tax. So the most important part of what we're trying to, to make up would come from revising the income tax brackets on the very wealthy. And what we've said is that those people who have a taxable income over $15,000 should pay not 7%, but 8%. And those with a taxable income of over $20,000 should pay 9%, and those with a taxable income of over 10, 10, 10, uh, $25,000 should pay 10%. Now, taxable income means, for most people, maybe four or $5,000 more than they make in their, in their gross income. It's after deductions. Senate bills 158 and 159 that have been introduced by Senator McNeil Smith accomplish a great deal of the package that we've sought 
to, uh, to press for in this General Assembly. Now, I would be uh, not candid if I said to you that we have, we're going to get tax reform in this General Assembly. We have senators, powerful state senators like Ralph Scott from Alamance County who told me he hasn't received a single letter, a single phone call asking him to get rid of the food tax. And that's true in a number of, uh, of areas. So our job is really going to be to impress on legislators that we won't stand for this kind of tax system. We won't be had this way. Senators and economists feel like taxes and tax structures are technical matters that trade unionists and working people shouldn't pay attention to. We shouldn't get involved and find out what all this means. It's a lot of numbers. It takes a lot of study to understand what it is. But we can understand that we're being had and we expect to change. And the only way we can communicate that to our legislators is by letter, is by personal conversation, is by telephone. And then, if they don't heed our, heed our, our message, at the ballot box. Now Jim Hunt's political guy told me when I was trying to get them to endorse our package that he knew that most of the people in this state were against the sales tax on food. But what he told me was this, that the people who vote like the sales tax on food. It's two different groups. It's it's people who work for a living and poor folks who do not get out to vote. And they're interested in votes. So we really have another job, which is to make sure that we can get all of our people to the poll so people who make decisions on political grounds, and that's how most of them make their decisions, will make their decisions reflecting our wishes and not simply the wishes of the people who drive the Cadillacs that park in the General Assembly building. I talked a, a minute about North Carolinians for tax reform, and it's been a very interesting experience being executive director of that group because I really, I don't think I really understood what a coalition was all about. And I said that we've, we've come into a coalition with the Christian Action League, and it's a very powerful group in this state. They defeated liquor by the drink. Well, in order to have a package that would involve them, we had to in some way ask for increased taxes on beer and wine and whiskey. And I personally am opposed to that. I think that, uh, that beer and wine and whiskey are taxed plenty and that poor folks buy beer and wine and whiskey and it's a kind of a regressive tax. But it's important that we form these kinds of coalitions so that we can expand our base and so that other people can help us press the issues that we're interested in. So I would encourage you all when you go over to the General Assembly today to ask the legislator who comes from your area, just how do you feel about the tax package that McNeil Smith has introduced? And then if you would, write it down on a card or get in touch with me personally and tell me how that legislator felt because as you've all found out dealing with legislators before, they'll tell you one thing and me another and then they'll go tell somebody else something else. So I want to be able to go back to them and say, I want to go back to them and say, well, Bill Brawley said you were in favor of our tax package. And therefore, we expect you to toe the line and vote for it. I hope you take some of the extra copies back to your local unions and show the people in your local unions just how badly they're being ripped off.
Chris just spoke to you about the number one legislative goal of the AFL-CIO, and that's the removal of the sales tax on food and making up that revenue by replacing it four different methods. And I think just as well as, because I don't really agree that Max Smith's bill really covers everything we want to say over there. We've got a program and it's been endorsed by the 22 organizations and that bill covering the entire spectrum of our package has not been introduced yet, but it's going to be introduced and that's the bill we're going to be supporting in the end. And we don't have that bill or a number of it for you this morning. But I want to very briefly run over again what Chris said. And that is our number one legislative goal is the repeal of the sales tax on food. And we're going to make that money back up so the state can continue to give the services that it's giving now in four ways. One of them is the removal of the $80 limit on the 1% sales tax on heavy machinery that's bought by corporations. Right now, everybody else pays 4% on most things, but they got a 1% on machinery, and they got an $80 limit. We want to remove that $80 limit, and that's recommended by the Tax Commission study. We want to remove, in the same part of that recommendation, the $120 limit that's on automotive equipment. North Carolina is the only state in the union that's got a limit on automotive equipment. While we pay 4% sales tax on food, when we buy a car, we pay 2%. And there's a limit. When you buy a car over $6,000, it's off. If you buy a Lincoln Continental or a Cadillac or a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes Benz, you don't have to pay it after $6,000. But every poor worker pays it on a $6,000 Ford or a Chevrolet he buys. And if you buy a $250,000 airplane or a yacht or a tractor trailer, you pay $120. So when they get through hitting the workers, they take it off. And we say, if you can afford a Merkin, if you can afford a Lincoln Continental or a Cadillac or a $250,000 airplane, you can afford to pay the tax on it. We want the limit off now. Amen. We want to increase the tax a little bit on whiskey, beer, and wine, because you don't have to have it to live. That's one of the luxuries we enjoy. But you don't have to have it. But our poor people on Social Security and on welfare have to have food to eat. And we want it taken off of the necessities of life and put where it ought to be. Charlie, I know you have to pay a little bit more, but I'm just <laughs> sorry about that. And the fourth thing, we want to close that tax loophole they got in this state that says if you own stock in a North Carolina-based corporation that you don't have to pay any income tax on the income you get from that stock on business done in North Carolina. We got people who get over $100,000 in, in stock dividends that don't pay one cent of income tax in this state on it. Now I ask you, do they take yours out before you get your check? You know they do, and they don't take theirs at all. And those are the four things. I'll make one more point because Penny told me there was going to be a boiler maker down here didn't agree with me because he makes over $15,000. We want to raise the income tax in the upper brackets, and it'll only hit 1.5% of the people in this state. And that one and a half percent is not in this room. And what we're saying is you raise the income tax because right now, if you make $10,000 or $10 million, your income tax rate is the same thing. It's 7%. Now, we say put it up to 8% after 15000 on taxable income. Difference between salary and taxable income the difference is, as Chris pointed out, if you pay tax on 15000 by the time you get your exemptions and deductions in there, you're making 19000 And the same thing is true all up the line. And there's two other things here. Number one, if you get into that upper bracket, and a few of our union members will get into it, remember this. 
you're saving somewhere between $120 and $125 on your food tax, number one. Anything you pay in increased income tax to the state of North Carolina, you get off of your state income, I mean off of your federal income tax. So we figure somebody has to be making over $22,500 to have a tax increase under our tax reform program. That's what I want you to tell them, not just Max Smith's bill, but that whole package we're talking about there, and you want to see that legislation passed now. We've got, will they hold up that big sign there? We got about 5,000 of these repeal food tax posters here, and they're going to be put in the back of the hall before you leave here today, and I want you to take them. Take them back to your local and get them put up in the union hall, get them put up in the stores, put them on telephone poles, put them there so the legislators in your area will know there's a campaign. In addition to that, Willie, we got a box over there. It's got 10,000 bumper stickers. Not bumper stickers, zip strips, union made, plastic. You want to take them off six months from now, just rip them off. They're union made and they cost more than them cheap paper ones the politicians give out, but you'll enjoy them more too. All right, that's our tax reform program. The second thing on our legislative agenda is the enactment of an agency shop bill. Now, to, to enact the agency shop bill, we got to modify the right to work law. But I don't want nobody going over there talking about the right to work law. Just forget the right to work law. We just want an agency shop bill because the federal government requires us to represent all people in a plant or all people on a job. If there's a union there, in matters of wages, hours, and working conditions, and if you please, grievance procedure. And since some of us have spent, I've been saying $700, and a CWA man told me he spent over $3,000 taking a grievance for a non-union worker up through arbitration, we are spending over $3,000 to represent a non-union worker. A scab in my book, or some people call him a free rider. Whatever they are, if we're going to spend our money to represent them, then if they are not made to join the union, they ought to be made to pay a service fee to the union for the representation they get. And that's what the agency shop bill does. It allows, it doesn't compel now, and this is a good argument, it doesn't make anybody do anything. It allows not only labor, but management to negotiate the agency shop clause into a contract. And once that's in there, then if the people want to join the union, they can. If they don't, they pay a service fee to the union for the services that we render to them in contract negotiations on wages, hours, working conditions, and by using our grievance procedure. That's what the agency shop bill is, and we're going to get it. We may not get it this time, but we're not going to give up. We are now in the process of preparing, I hope, if our money holds out, and if you got your per capita behind, get it in, we need it. We're going to try to prepare a thousand kits on the agency shop. And that thousand kits will be sent to every full-time staff person in this state, every local union that's affiliated with the state F of LCIO, every member of the General Assembly, every, we're going to make a personal visit around to every editor of a daily newspaper to try to explain to him exactly what the agency shop is and so we can get at least favorable editorials or at least if they're going to write an anti-union editorial they'll know why they're doing it and we're, we're kind of lucky we, we use every bit of help we can get and and we got one unpaid staff member who's uh, intern from Meredith College, uh, Marlon Getzinger, over here, stand up Marlon. Marlon is taking uh, as, a, as her college course. She's working with the labor movement for the next four months and she's getting college credit for doing it. And she's doing all the research and helping of rewriting uh, and history of the, the union security clauses in this state and nation for this kid I'm talking about. So I wanted you to know about that. Third thing, and I, I call you back to Ed Dowd's speech, there are 265,000 public employees in this state 
who work for local government, who work for county government, and who work for state government, and we only got one group, one group, two, it's one group, it's two unions who have a contract with the state of North Carolina, and it's the first meeting they've attended of the state of Bell CIO. They just affiliated, and I want them to stand up, the longshoremen from the Ports Authority in Wilmington. They've negotiated one contract, and we're going back in there, and we're giving them assistance from our research department to negotiate a good contract come June. Now, these people have got a contract because the Federal Labor, the Railway Labor Act, they were judged by a federal judge that they come under the Railway Labor Act because they run the railroads on the, on the state property down there. And so they've got a union and they've got a contract. It's got to be improved, but it's a foot in the door. And we've got other people here from public employee unions. And while I'm talking about that, John, if you will, come on up. The AF of LCIO has created within the last three, four months a public employee department. Public employee unions are the fastest growing unions in this country. Our potential in this state is 265,000 union members out of public employees. We're going after them. We've got already set up a federal government employee committee. We are establishing the local government employee committee as a subcommittee of our government employee committee, and just as soon as they let us, or we're going to go on and set up a public employee department, and I hope soon when they decide that they want this in Washington, they'll charter our public employee department down here. We have not got our public employee bill introduced. Our public employee bill is ready. I want to meet with all of the public employee unions here immediately upon adjournment of our session at 12. John McCart wants to have a few words of personal. He's going to explain very briefly to all of you what the public employee department's doing. But we've got some work. We want the public employee unions, both federal and state, as well as the central labor union presidents that are here to come up immediately after adjournment here today to the front of the room. The fourth important part in our, our uh, blueprint is to raise the minimum wage for people in this state who are not covered by the federal law from a dollar and eighty cents to two dollars an hour. And we're going to have to do two things along that line. After we propose this, our good friend the Commissioner of Labor has come out with his program and that is to say that they pay college students 85% of the minimum wage. 85% of two dollars would amount to a 10 cent reduction in the present dollar and 80 cent and college students are and some of them are talking about broadening to include 18 year olds and under that they would be paid 85 percent or rather than even getting what they're getting now would be a 10 cent cut from what they're getting now and they would be allowed to pay these people a dollar and 70 cent and they may not do it over my dead body, they're going to do it over a lot of hell raised by us, and I want your support on it. There are two other things we want to do on the minimum wage law. One of them is to see right now in the state, if you're a tipped employee like the girls in the cafeteria or the bellhops, you can be paid half of the minimum wage. We had a legislative dinner. A lot of y'all came to our legislative dinners around. We had one down in Wilmington, and I was telling the legislators that we want to change that law for waitresses and others who are tipped employees, and instead of saying they can get 50% of the minimum wage, make it that they can get 75% of the minimum wage. A little girl came up to me when I got through speaking. You say, say you said we're supposed to be paid for working here? You know, they're not even paying them 50%. All the little girl was getting was her tips. And we want to see, number one, some damn enforcement of that minimum wage law. And number two, we want to see the 50% change to 75%. But we're going to do that in a separate bill after we get minimum wage passed. And if we get 75%, that'll mean they'll be going from the present 90 cent to a dollar and a half an hour. Anybody out there thinks it's too much, don't lobby for it. The other thing is the Equal Rights Amendment 
The AFL-CIO in the state has been for the Equal Rights Amendment since it was first passed by Congress. We worked hard for it last time. We failed. But many of the people who are working hard for ERA are our friends and are supporting practically our entire legislative program. It's right. It's proper. Uh, Delbert, are you in here? Somebody from CWA in here? Get those brochures out back there and pass them out up and down the aisles, if you will, on ERA. Uh, we're supposed to have a young lady to come over and talk about that. Is Nancy Drum here yet? Somebody see if Chris can locate Nancy Drum and bring her in. She's supposed to be here by now. Uh, I'll let her talk very briefly about ERA. Let me just make one other announcement on it. I believe it's at 3 o'clock this afternoon. There's a hearing in the auditorium on the third floor of the legislative building on ERA. Now, what they try to do usually is to pack these hearings with the people that are against them. And the guy that's chairman of this committee is against everything. And uh, he's against labor, he's against women, he's against blacks, he's against the ERA. So I'd like to see as many of you as possible go up there and show your support for ERA this afternoon because those other people are going to be there trying to keep it down. The sixth thing, and it's a sort of an all-inclusive thing, and I think it's probably the most important thing affecting our people now, is the unemployment compensation law. Right now, our work last year raised the minimum from a bare $12 to $15. We tried to raise it to $24. We had the commissioner give us an analysis of what it would cost to double the minimum rate. If you're out of work, you could get as low as $12 last year. Now you can get $15. It would have cost $542,000 to have raised the minimum amount by double, to make it 24 instead of 12. They've got, bear in mind, they've got or had $587 million, million dollars in the reserve fund. It would have cost approximately eight-tenths of one percent, no, I'm to give the poorest people in this state a double to 24. They made it 15. You know what happened? They took the tax load off of the corporations again and put it on me and you because people getting $15 a week can't pay the light bills, much less buy food. You know, and if you can't pay them, then you got to go to welfare. And me and you pay for welfare for those people that the corporations, bear in mind one other thing, when Franklin Roosevelt passed the unemployment law back in the Depression days, there was a 3% ceiling there for payroll taxes. And they let the states pass the laws, and if you take care of it down here, uh, then we won't, uh, you know, we won't, uh, we won't run it from Washington. So they're taking care of it down here, and what they're doing is they've got an experience rating, and the benefits are so low in this state, they built up a reserve of $587 million a reserve of $587 million, but they were able to do that by cutting their taxes from 3% of the payroll to on the $4,200, which is all they have to pay on unless things get real bad. They pay eight-tenths or one-fourth of what they're supposed to pay, and on the total payroll, it's five-tenths of one percent or one-sixth of what they're supposed to pay, and paying one-fourth and one-sixth of what they're supposed to pay, and the low benefits they paid, they get $587 million that they set aside. So don't worry about North Carolina going bankrupt, not that tax fund. You worry about these workers out here that are getting $15 a, a week to eat and feed the families on going bankrupt. That's what we're trying to do, and we're trying to raise that to 25 percent of the average wage in the state, which would be about $30 this time. I think we can get some of it if you work on it while you're up there. While they were into the law last year, they're hitting at these people who have bad work experience. They're really talking about a lot of our poor whites and poor blacks in eastern North Carolina who farm all year during the summer and work about three or four months. Now, that three or four months is all they got them on the books is working because they don't count none of that farm labor they do. They're not covered when they're working on the farm. You see, they, they don't make nothing, but they're not covered. They're now covered by a federal law, which was passed by Congress on December 20th. 
but they're not covered by state law. And so they say, we'll cut you down. Where you used to be able to get 26 weeks unemployment last year, they cut it back to you can get as little as 13 weeks if you qualify. See, now you can get 13 weeks. And that applies to a lot of our workers. A lot of our building tradesmen who are not, not able to work all the time are going to find out that they're not eligible for 26 weeks. You're going to be put in a category that you can get from 13 to 26 weeks. Maybe you'll get 18, maybe you'll get 20, according to how good you've been able to work in the past year. And if you're unemployed, you know, next time you go up, you might not even be eligible for unemployment compensation. And they can raise that there $587 million up to to uh, 650 million if they want to. We're trying, right now, the formula that they use, just so you'll know, is you get half of your pay when you're out of work. Of course, that pay goes back six quarters or a year and a half, and you get it on the top quarter of the previous four quarters prior to this. So if you were making $180 a week uh, 18 months ago, you qualify for the uh, maximum now, which is $90 a week, which is $26 a week raise we got last year for the top people in the state. And what we're trying to do is change it. We changed the formula to get that. It was 50% of your wage up to 50% of the average wage in the state. We changed the formula to 50% of your wage up to two-thirds of the average weekly wage, which raised it up $26. Now, we're going over there and try to get this time, and remember these figures, we're going to try to change the 50% of your wage to 60%. We're going to try to change the 66 and two-thirds percent of the average weekly wage to 75%. If we did this, this would give us about $115 or $120 maximum that you could get. So bear that in mind as you, as you go over there and, and legislate. The other thing that we're trying to change in the law They've got a section in there that says that if there's a, quote, labor dispute, unquote, in progress in your company, then you can't draw unemployment compensation. Now, we've been, uh, we've been having problems enough with this thing when labor dispute was looked on as a strike. Uh, but we got a situation right now, right here in Raleigh, where we got 200 workers who went out on strike and in effect, they decided to go back in. They filed unfair labor practice charges, and the company has been found guilty. These people were out. They were locked out. They voted to go off strike. They went back and applied for their jobs, and they were locked out. So they're not on strike. They're locked out. And a labor dispute means if the management decides you have a, you're locked out, that's a labor dispute. And I think if you carry it to the extreme that it can be carried to by these bureaucrats in this state. If you got a grievance that's unsettled in the local union, you got a labor dispute, and if they lay off 200 people while you got that grievance, they can say you're not allowed unemployment compensation. So we have got to change that part of the law, and what we're saying in that is that if you actively participating in a strike by your local union against the company, all right, deny you unemployment compensation benefit. But if that strike in Illinois or Indiana, as it was by Western Electric last year by an entirely different union that makes a part that one of the plants down here or three of the plants down here use, and you're thrown out of work, it ain't your damn fault and you ought not be penalized. And we're going to say further in cases like Eastern Airlines, if the pilots go on strike, there's no need to lay the machinist off down here in Raleigh-Durham in Charlotte and say they're not eligible to draw compensation. They got nothing to do with whether the pilots fly that plane or not. They're innocent victims of the circumstances. The same thing with employees who worked last year, machinists who signed a contract with Trailways, and the bus drivers decided that they didn't get what they wanted. They went out, and for four months we had a strike. And the machinists had to stand by in case the bus drivers settled, start those buses. And if they didn't, they wouldn't have had a job when they went back. So they were penalized four months and couldn't draw unemployment compensation. We want the labor dispute section out, and we want it amended very briefly again to the fact that the only thing that you can penalize a worker under his unemployment compensation if he's actively participating in the strike or his local union is. Understand that we, we get, in every one of your kits, you've got our 
a blueprint for a better North Carolina, which is our legislative program. Naturally, this program will change from time to time because of laws somebody introduced that are good, because some of the laws that are introduced are bad, and we'll either be for them or against them based on how they come in. And we'll let you know about that at the legislative bulletin. I don't know when you registered whether the girls at the desk got your names and address or not. But we have a legislative bulletin that goes out to about 2,000 people every week talking about our legislative program and what things are doing in the legislature. And we want you to write on them. But if you're not getting that and they didn't get your name and address, write your name and address on a piece of paper and take it out to the desk and put on it legislative bulletin and they'll add you to our legislative bulletin list. Chris, Nancy's not here yet, right? Chris, all right. I'm right. The hearing's in the auditorium at 3 o'clock. ERA hearing's in the auditorium at 3 o'clock. And like I say, I'd like for you, many of you as can, to be there and support this. Let me just give you one other thing. As you go in over there, you might want to ask the girl at the desk, where, where's your representative's office? And she'll tell you 2116. Well, hell, I've been there five years, and I get lost about a third of the time now when I try to look up something like 400 offices. But there's a map in your thing which gives you the first floor and the second floor and gives you every one of the meeting halls and every one of the uh, offices of the legislative representatives. So if you don't know where your representative is and you go in the hall, as soon as you go in the lobby of the legislative building, ask her at the desk there, and she'll tell you, and you can take this little blue, and I think some of them are printed on yellow paper, and find out where your legislative representative is. Willie, what you got? I just like to know this is, I got a daughter's a school teacher, and she told me that this was the first year that uh, the teacher can draw on employment, and they give much credit to you, and I think some of them will write you about it, because this is the first year they have ever drawn it been teaching. They've been out three months, so they give them an extra month to work, but they get draw on it for two months. This is the first year they'll be able to do it. You get much credit to the president. I'll be able to help you out with the state. Gene, you're going to be ready in a few. Let me say, those of you going to participate in this Put America Back to Work session that's going to go on here in about 10 minutes, if you will, come up to the front here as soon as you get a chance so we can see who's here. Uh, this time I'd like to introduce John McCard, who's the acting director of the Public Employee Department, recently created by the North, by the, not the North Carolina AFL, but by the National AFL CIO. John? Wilbur and delegates to this North Carolina State Federation Legislative Conference. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, and I mean that because just in the short hour and a half that we've been... No, he, he said he wasn't. Just in the short hour and a half that I've uh, been with you this morning, I learned a great deal. Uh, for those of us who are working in the public department, uh, public employee department now, it is essential that we get a grasp of the problems that are confronting our trade union members and the public sector at the grassroots level. And this kind of experience is most helpful in that connection. I listened with great interest to the testimony of the industrial uh, relations, uh, labor relations expert before the Manufacturing and Labor Committee, which uh, we heard earlier this morning. I want to assure you that that gentleman isn't alone, isn't a voice crying in the wilderness of North Carolina. There is a campaign afoot by the National Right to Work Committee, which prepared the material on the agency shop. 
to expand the right to work concept to the public sector in the various states and the various localities and to the National Congress itself. As a matter of fact, one of the primary targets of the Right to Work Committee and its allied organizations is the defeat of any legislation in the National Congress which will afford collective bargaining rights to public workers generally and to federal workers in particular. I am very much assured in looking through your legislative program to note that the enactment of collective bargaining legislation for state and local employees in North Carolina is one of the primary objectives of the North Carolina AFL-CIO. A little bit later, I am anticipating the opportunity of talking with those of you who uh, operate in the public service in the uh, state of North Carolina and in the federal agencies located here to speak a little more in detail about the activities of the Public Employee Department and uh, how we can be of service and how uh, we can learn from what you're experiencing here at the uh, state level. I want to certainly wish all of you well in your legislative endeavors and to assure you that the Public Employee Department will be happy to render any service it can, not only with respect to the public sector, but with respect to the entire AFL-CIO program. Jim Sala, a little later the regional director, is going to uh, walk through with you some of the actions of the uh, general board of the AFL-CIO uh, in January and of the AFL-CIO Executive Council last month. And throughout those the action program that was advocated by the AFL-CIO, you will notice a thread, a thread of attention to workers in the public service. To me, it seems that our labor movement is becoming more and more aware of the importance of public service workers in our entire economy. I just want to make one final observation in that connection. Many of us have grown up in the public service with the thought that if we did our jobs well and if the merit system worked at all, we would be assured of job security. The brother here has just uh, mentioned that there are teachers eligible for unemployment in the state of North Carolina. Throughout this nation, we are witnessing states and local communities that are in the process of either discharging employees, public service workers, or failing to fill public service worker vacancies. So that the impact of the recession, inflation that we're experiencing is being felt in the public sector as well as by our sisters and brothers in private industry. At the moment, it may not be quite as severe, but the problem, unless we solve the total problem of our economy, the problem for our public service workers is going to become more and more difficult in terms of unemployment, job loss, and victimization of the workers generally that we find in our country because of this terrible inflationary spiral. I wish you well in your endeavors this afternoon in the, uh, in the legislature and again assure you that the Public Employee Department will, will be happy to render whatever service it can to all of our sisters and brothers in the public service certainly, but beyond that in the trade union movement as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. And we now have with us for a few brief remarks about the situation on the ERA bill, the coordinator of ERA United in the state, which the AFL-CIO is one of the affiliated members of that, and Pat Winger, our Western North Carolina director, serves on the executive board. 
gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you our good friend Nancy Drum. Nancy. Thank you, and I want to thank all of you, and especially the staff at the AFL-CIO for all the really beautiful work you've done for us. I want to reiterate that this is one of the most important issues that the General Assembly is going to be facing this year. We need your continued support. The opposition is moving and snowballing to an extent that we had never anticipated with a letter writing campaign. So if any of you are prolific letter writers, if you're not, please become so. Write letters to your legislators. Write not just one, write 20, write 50, and keep them coming. Legislators are now weighing mail instead of counting it. And this seems to be one of the issues that, uh, on which, or on the basis upon which, some of the legislators are actually going to be making their decisions. Uh, we would like to invite you to attend the committee hearings this afternoon. They're being held at 3 o'clock in the uh, auditorium. It's on the third floor in the General Assembly. When you walk in the front entrance, just go up the stairs, the carpeted stairs that you can't walk on, uh, to the back of the general back of the, the uh, building, and the seating capacity I think uh, accommodates 300 people. So if you want to be there, you better be there early. I think it will be a very interesting hearing. This is the proponents' hearings. The opponents' hearings are scheduled for the following week, and the week after that, we will have testimony from legal experts from around the state so that this will not come to a vote in the House probably for another four weeks. Um, so I urge and ask and plead for your help in a letter writing campaign, which we are at this point trying to augment and to carry on. And secondly, again, to reiterate uh, our very, very sincere appreciation of all the work that you've done and are doing now. Thank you. Let me say, Nancy Lee's, these brochures we passed all out to you, we got them by the box load back there, thanks to CWA. And I wish you would take a handful of them. Take a handful of them, and when you go with the legislature to talk about our program today, leave one of these with each representative and with each senator that you visit. All right? Can't say I'm not efficient. I got background music for you during the whole conference. <laughs> Jim Sala, if Jim Sala and Eugene Ruff and Lloyd Byrd and Delbert Gordon and Arnold Brown will come forward here, we'll go now into the part of our program which uh, AF of LCO President George Meany requested us to have. This part of your program is called the Put America Back to Work part of our program. And we've got a kit which we gave you, a yellow kit, which contains about six of the statements on the most important issues facing the country and the Put America Back to Work program. They are on the other side. There's a little brochure in there which explains in detail the Put America Back to Work program. There are several reprints from the AFL-CIO Federationist in there. There's a tremendous amount of extremely good material there. And after the conference is over and after you've heard these speakers, I want you to be sure, if you will, to take this back home and study it and take action in lo your local union to support this program. This is the program that was adopted in Washington by the General Executive Board, which consists of the presidents of each international union within the AFL-CIO, or his designee, plus all the 50 state presidents who were invited to sit in and participate in that meeting. It was one of the best meetings that I've ever attended in the AFL-CIO, and to give you the AFL-CIO program now, I introduce to you Jim Sala, the Regional Director of the AFL-CIO Organizing and Field Staff. Thank you, Wilbur. I guess I have to start out by saying it's nice to be here, and believe me, it is. I heard Wilbur Hobry's testimonial that he read from the newspaper, and I just wonder what would happen in this state with the type leadership that you have 
if you were some 17 or 18 percent organized, realizing what you're able to do with only seven and a half percent of the workforce organized. So I think that when you get yourselves organized here and get some of these non-union people, I just th think that this state's going to be one of them that's going to jump to the top as far as labor activity. Got an opportunity to talk to an old friend last night, John McCart. It seems we're right back where we were 15 years ago when President Kennedy had a task force to bring the fruits of collective bargaining to the federal employees. And at that time we thought, wow, we're on the way. Federal employees first and all the public employees next. And here we find ourselves 15 years later we're still on that same plateau. We're still fighting the same battle. But I think we can look forward to some relief in that area. As Wilbur mentioned, the General Executive Board met January of this year, which consisted of the principal officers of each one of your international unions. And at that time, they adopted a program, which I'm going to walk through with you which I think is the only program that this country had now has before it to put this country back on its feet. Back in 1971, the deposed president, along with his chief architect for disaster, Arthur Burns, with the Federal Reserve Board, initiated a program <coughs> which I and a lot of people in the labor movement are convinced was designed to bring us to the point that we find ourselves now. At that time, we had about 4% inflation rate and about a 5% unemployment rate, which we thought was unacceptable then. After some four and a half years of then mismanaging the economy, we find ourselves today, and I don't believe their figures, by the way, where they say we're now at 8.2% unemployed, which by the way, if you, don't, if you get past the figures, we're talking about some 8 million people who do not have a job, and a 12% inflation rate. Now in anybody's box score, that's pretty bad. But we're the only ones that's getting hit with it. The profits are still going up, the companies are not hurting, the stockholders are not hurting. The banks, that's something I've never been able to figure out. I'm not an economist like your young fella Chris said, and I hope that I'll never become one, but nobody's ever been able to explain to me that putting a nine and 10% interest rate on the money that is borrowed helps the economy. I hope that I'm not stupid, but I've never been able to, to understand that. That if you put money in the hands of the bankers, and the big money people, that this is helping the economy. Nobody's ever been able to make me believe that. Yet that's what's happening. And we're being told day by day, the president has a road show going around the country. And I was either privileged or uh, saddled with the responsibility of attending the one in Atlanta. And we had Secretary Lynn, we had Frank Czar of the Energy Czar, uh, Czar and these people were trying to tell us how good they're being to us. Ostensibly, the, the session, the president's uh, uh, meeting on the domestic and economic uh, situation we're in, was to get the input of the people around the country. But we were lectured to. We were told that this is the best thing that's ever happened to us. We were told we never had it so good. We were told that wait for six more months and things would be back to normal. Well, most of you in this room remember the freezes, the phases, and, and what have you under the old Nixon administration. Well, I want to tell you it's still continuing. Those of you that think because we changed presidents that we have a flaming liberal in the White House, I want to recount to you what he's doing to us. He's telling us that Arthur Burns has a perfect right to continue to raise the interest rates keep our people from working in the housing industry, and this is good for us. And I'm just amazed. I'm amazed that, that, we, that we take this, you know, just relaxed, that there's not a general up uprising, and not a general outcry, that these people are zapping us at every turn. 
And you people here in this room are leaders of your respective organizations. And I would hope, as Wilbur says, that you take this information that we've given you in these brochures, take it back to your people. I'd like to walk through the program with you, but before I walk through it, I'd like to comment on the President's program. You've read about it in the paper, you've heard it on the news media. An economist, and Lord, we have to quote these people, but there's nothing better on the scene. If you ask a competent economist for a plan that would worsen the nation's economic ills, you would put a heavy tax on some major commodity, such as oil. You would make sure that the dollars collected by this tax are not returned to the people. You would get the people out of work in the private sector and rehire them in the public sector. You would institute a tight monetary policy and then subsidize investments. You would increase the cost of food stamps and don't let Social Security payments increase with prices. I've just read to you the President's program to cure our economic ills. And yet every economist says that this is the way to worsen our situation. At this General Executive Board meeting, a six-point program was adopted. And as I said before, we feel that this is the only program that's been instituted either by the executive branch or the legislative, legislative branch to bring us out of this situation we're in. The first part is an immediate tax cut. Under the President's proposal on a tax cut, it reminds me back when I was a little younger, you'd go to a small loan company and you'd make a $200 loan, but before they'd give you that $200, you'd have to sign a note that you'd pay $400 back. Well, this is exactly what the President's tax program proposes, that we would get a rebate. And as one of the speakers said before me, most of it would have been in the higher income brackets. But for that rebate, we would put a surcharge on the oil that's being imported into this country. And every single item that's produced with petroleum would go up. And our people have estimated that this would be in the neighborhood of an additional $500 per year, gasoline taxes, <coughs> utility taxes, and all the other things that are utilized from petroleum. So immediately that tax program does nothing for us. I'm happy to say that the program that the Congress is now working on, we don't feel it's enough, but the $21 billion program that they're working on in the Congress, which we think was modeled after our program, would alleviate some of those ills. It would give the rebates back to those people making under $10,000 a year. It would not allow the president to deregulate the natural gas. It would not allow the president to put a surcharge on the oil imports. So we feel that any support that can be engendered for this particular program, that you can write to your congressman, and I heard one of the speakers say there'll be an Easter recess, you can get a hold of your congressman. This is good, the congressional program. It's not enough but at least it's a start in the right direction. The second point, immediate government measures to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. At the General Executive Board meeting, I was privileged to hear Paul Hall from the Seafarers talk. And he said it's embarrassing and degrading for this country to watch our one man, uh, I don't know what to call him, but Henry Kissinger, to go around and pay tribute in words and money to the blackmailers of the Arab states for this oil. We should immediately put restraints on ourselves and ask the Congress to put restraints on ourselves and insist that the oil corporations who are making anywhere from 200% to 600% profits on their investments immediately work on these people to <coughs> invest in our, domestic, in our domestic oil production. We can do it. This is a program that we're in favor of. And I'm not going through the additional things that's in the book because I think you can pick them up yourselves. Immediate reduction of interest rates. Again, at the General Executive Board meeting, it was pointed out that the Soviet Union, from the World Bank, the place that we're putting an awful lot of money into, 
is able to borrow money from us at a 6% interest rate. And yet our people, the people that we represent, have to pay anywhere from 8 to 11% to buy a home. This should be taken care of. We should immediately have the Congress reenact the Credit Control Act of 1969, which insists and allows the Federal Reserve Board to bring interest rates down, to allocate credit to the housing industry where we have some 24% of our building tradesmen out of work, and to allocate credit to those social agencies, uh, to plants that employ our members. This can be done. There's a law on the books, yet the administration continues to allow these high interest rates. And again, within our booklet, you'll see more on that. And you should utilize your resources and the resources of your local unions and central labor councils to contact your congressman. Impounded funds. Those of you who have been reading the newspapers lately read about the Supreme Court's ruling that the president, whether it be Ford or Nixon, had no right to impound the funds, and we're talking about $19 billion that, have, that has already been appropriated by the Congress for water and sewer projects, for highway construction. Even though the courts have ruled that these funds have been impounded illegally, they still have not been released. We're talking about money that if is, is released into the various political subdivisions in your state and the other states could immediately, immediately put our members back to work. We're talking about money that the Congress has already appropriated. We're talking about building water and storage plants. Nine billion dollars that if it was released into the political subdivisions tomorrow could put 450,000 American workers back to work. This can be done, but it's not going to be done unless we contact our congressmen. The highway funds. Again, your state, and I don't have the figures, your president would probably have them, but there's some $9 billion that could be immediately released. And this would not only help the people that you represent, but your communities. And part of our action program is that you would go to the city councils, and I would hope Wilbur, the legislature, and have them pass resolutions. And certainly they can't be against this because you're talking about a mayor of a particular city uh, passing a resolution and sending a telegram asking the executive branch to release money so he can put some of his constituents and voters back to work. We would hope that you would immediately go back to your respective areas and ask the city fathers and the various political subdivisions to pass these type resolutions to send these kind of communications to Washington. And I would hope that when you would do that or have it done, that you would send a copy also here to your state officers. I'm not going to talk about the unfair competition that we're getting from uh, the low paid industries that where we ship all of our raw materials out of the country. I think you've heard about this at your last state convention. But we should be contacting our congressmen and telling them, put some stiff tariffs on this slave labor over in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and places like that, that when they do bring the materials over here, specifically in the garment industry, there's not any reduction in price. They're paying something like 14 to 18 cents an hour to make a shirt, and they bring that shirt over here. They compete with our labor, but they don't sell it at that price. They sell it at the regular price. And I'm not going to give you a speech on Buy American, but I think this. You're employed, you're under a collective bargaining relationship, and you should support those people who are supporting you. On unemployment, I guess, Wilburn, you can correct me if I'm wrong, though the national average they say is 8.2. I would imagine in the state of North Carolina, it's probably closer to 11.5 or even 12%. We have a responsibility to our local union members when they're out of work to help them get their unemployment. I heard from some of your speakers and your president today that you do have plans for this. You'll find again some of these brochures and booklets where you can set up some of the, uh, eliminate some of the red tape in the Central Labor Council. Now, we're not coming down here asking you to do something that should be foreign to your nature. We're asking you to support the program that your general executive officers did at the General Executive Board, 
we're asking you to support a program that's going to benefit the people that you represent. But we're not simply coming down here asking you to do it without offering you some help. There's four staff people from the AFL-CIO working in the state of North Carolina. They've been relieved of most of their other responsibilities. They're specifically assigned to work with your state president and the central labor councils. And specifically on the last item on this last page where it puts a little work on the central labor councils. I went into that yesterday with the central labor councils, so I won't go over it. But there are some things we can do. There is some action we can take. But if you just do not do anything, then none of this action will be taking place. And Wilbur, just before I sit down, because I know there's going to be other people speaking, I'd like to introduce the staff of AFL-CIO so when they're in this area, whenever they can help you through the Central Labor Councils, that you'll call upon them. Ray Snell, did you stand up? Ray's on the eastern part of the state. Hollis Hale, he's got the mountains over there in Asheville. Curtis, Curtis Bullock, I guess you have the northeastern part of the state. And Lodge Jackson, who's been working with you for a lot of years, has this part of the state. So again, we're not asking you to do something without giving you some help. But we feel, the FFL-CIO and the Executive Council, that this is the most important item now facing us. Put our people back to work. Give them jobs. We don't want handouts. The labor movement has never looked for handouts. Give our people a fair shake. And we would hope that you would take this message back to the people that you represent and support us in this program. Thank you, Wilbur. Chair, at this time, we'd like to call on Eugene Ruff, the president of the North Carolina State Building and Construction Trades Council, to talk about unemployment in the building trades. Eugene? Thank you, President Hobby. Brother Sala has uh, pretty well stolen a lot of what I was going to say here. When he talks about uh, the building trades, uh, unemployment, and the impounded funds, these are two of the things that uh, I was wanting to relate to you. For the benefit of some of you that might not know just exactly what the building trades are, the building trades uh, are the people that do all the construction. We are the people that do the laboring work, the electrical work, the sheet metal, plumbing, boiler making, operating engineers, carpenters, all of the construction crafts. These crafts ha have what is called the North Carolina Building Trades Council. And as president of that council, I represent each and every one of these crafts. Now we have, uh, on the unemployment scene, I guess uh, we in construction have been hit as severely maybe more so than any of the other trade unionists, any of the other employees in the country. Let me cite just a few figures that, of unemployment through parts of the country here. In Detroit, construction unemployment averages 30 percent. For the electricians, it's 35 percent. For the laborers, 40 percent. For the painters, more than 45 percent. Cleveland, Ohio, construction unemployment is 30 percent. For the bricklayers there, it's 35 percent. For the plumbers, 40 percent. For the plasters, 55 percent unemployed. Boston, Massachusetts, it's 23 percent overall. One craft, the painters, has an unemployment rate of 65 percent right now. In Chicago, Illinois, it's 22 percent out of work. New York, 24 percent. San Diego, California, 25 percent. New Orleans, Louisiana, 27 percent. Flint, Michigan, 30 percent. These are figures that represent all the trades in those respective places. We do have problems. And it's time that uh, the administration and the Congress would take uh, positive and creative action to revive our economic system, not only to rebuild our economy, but to rebuild as well the human environments of our towns and cities. The administration in the Congress now has the opportunity to make wiser investments of public expenditures to stimulate both public and private construction in communities throughout America. In the near term, this will mean, mean jobs and a boost for the economy of communities everywhere. In the longer term, it will result in, result in permanent improvements to the physical environment to the direct benefit of all our citizens. We in the construction industry believe that the key to the nation's economic prosperity rests 
within our industry. Time after time, it has been demonstrated that a healthy construction industry is vital to a healthy nation. While no segment of our economy has suffered more from the current economic crisis, we are confident that the construction industry can and must lead the nation out of the recession and at the same time bring lasting public improvements to communities in every part of the country. To accomplish this, however, will require strong action and leadership from our administration and Congress. We propose as remedies to our current problems the following actions. Number one, funds currently impounded by the administration should be released immediately to construct facilities for health care, education, airports, mass transit, recreation, prisons, government offices, and neighborhood centers to provide needed community planning and make improvements to community environments. Number two, special emphasis should be placed on reviving and strengthening the nation's housing industry to provide decent homes for families with low and moderate incomes. Number three, a broad new national public works program should be initiated to improve the living environments of local communities. Number four, general revenue sharing funds and community development block grants should be used by state and local governments for direct construction activities in local communities. Number five, federal monetary policy should be revised to increase the availability of mortgage funds to the construction industry. Number six, tax incentives should be immediately provided to owners of new and existing buildings to design and redesign their structures to make them more energy sufficient and efficient. Number seven, similar incentives should be provided for the renovation and remodeling of existing unused or underused buildings to enable their adaptation for new or additional purposes, thus conserving energy and resources. We feel like that the implementation of the remedies we just related would help to bring around a, not only an increase in employment in the construction industry, uh, but would also uh, reflect upon the environmental habitation of the citizens of all the country. And since construction is, uh, it's a type industry that uh, we're related on certain industries, but so many industries are related on construction that we feel like that a good shot in the arm for the construction industry uh, would pull our country out of the present recession or if your neighbor is out of work uh, with the old interpretation we use, so many of uh, our members are out of work, we, we can call it a depression now. A recession, you know, is when your neighbor's out of work. Well, <coughs> our guys are out of work now, so it's depressions. In the Carolinas, specifically, the unemployment in the construction trades uh, by percentage would be very difficult to relate to you. Uh, I, w I dare say that the percentages I read off to you, uh, that our crafts, our local unions representing each branch of the construction industry, would have at least the percentage unemployment of some of the larger and better organized uh, cities that I've related. We're fortunate uh, to some degree by the fact that in the construction industry, uh, our members can, when work is available in other areas of our country, they can go and uh, solicit and work through other local unions in different areas. Of course, right now, there's not a lot of places to go to, uh, but this has helped some. If each of our locals would stop and count the people they have out of work now, along with those who are having to work in other parts of the country that they would prefer not to be uh, working in, but would much prefer to be working at home, uh, I dare say that our unemployment rates uh, would average anywhere from 30 to 50 percent in the state of North Carolina. We do think that, that the impoundment of the 19 or 20 billion dollars that occurred under our past president, ex-president Richard Nixon, uh, put us to a degree in the construction industry 
particularly uh, to a degree has uh, got us where we are now. When uh, this money is, is turned loose for the building of sewage and water treatment highways, it takes at least six months. There's a six month lapse between the releasing of funds like that before it would substantially help uh, those brothers uh, in the local unions in construction. Uh, we don't have a very pretty picture. We can't, uh, in the construction industry, we really can't see uh, just when daylight's going to come for us. We're constantly asked, uh, well, what do you think? Uh, you think uh, work's going to pick up here in, uh, in North Carolina for, for our construction brothers maybe by the middle of the summer or late summer, early fall? And quite frankly, uh, I can't give an affirmative answer. Uh, I don't believe it will, not substantially. Uh, we all have so many people unemployed that it's uh, going to be a hard road and a long time getting them all back into the workforce in our state of North Carolina. With that, I've uh, spread enough gloom, I guess. But uh, while I'm here, let me say, and I'd be very much amiss not to say it, I don't get a very, very often get an opportunity. <coughs> but let me say that in our building trades councils, we urge our locals and that are affiliated, and we urge all of our building tradesmen to always look for the union label. We urge them to buy American and to buy union. And I would request each and every one of you to ask for the shop card. When you see uh, an addition to your plant, an addition to your mill, your facility, wherever you may be working, don't be hesitant to ask for the shop card. Help the building tradesmen. We, we look for the label, and uh, we'd like for you to look for the shop card. This might help us get some work in here. Thank you much. The next speaker on our <coughs> agenda was to be Scott Harmon, the regional director for Textile Workers Union, but he had some business and could not be with us, and he asked Lloyd Bird, the business representative of Local 250 in Irwin and a vice president of the North Carolina State AFL-CIO, to give the report on the textile industry. I give you Lloyd Bird, vice president of the State AFL-CIO. He didn't ask me, he directed me. <laughs> what directed for? Get up here. I put two people back to work this morning at least. I got Bill Weatherman's watch on. I got a wrecked automobile out there. So I'm helping the unemployment situation a little bit the time I get out of here. I think it's good that a textile worker would follow or representative of the Textile Workers Union would follow the bill in trade, Speaker. In that, so much of textile is related to new homes. You start walking into a new home and you see after people move into it, you have the carpeting, you have the drapes, you have some of the formica and all this stuff. Textiles are closely related to the building trade. When housing's off, textiles off. Now Wilbur mentioned up here that there were 265,000 public employees in the state of North Carolina. You also heard that there were seven and a half percent of the working people in the state of North Carolina organized. Well, I got news for you. There are 280,000 textile workers in this state. And hell, we've been in a depression ever since I can remember. And I was born into it, reared into it, educated from it and everything else. So when you talk about recession and depression to textile workers, it's the normal way of life, really. I don't think that I have ever got up before a group to speak whether it be an international union or a local union meeting or a CLU meeting or any other type, 
that I didn't thank God for the Civil Rights Act that was passed in 1964 and went into effect July 1st, 1965, which said blacks could have access to all jobs in plants and what have you. That meant a great deal to the Textile Workers Union of America. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to a Southern textile worker. Scott Hoyman today is negotiating J.P. Stevens seven plants in Roanoke Rapids. And without the black vote of over 40% solid for a union, we wouldn't be negotiating there today. And I tell you this, I hope in my lifetime to see the textile industry organized in the South. That's where it's all at. And it's never going to happen until whites can get together like blacks by God and act in unity. And I thank you for that. Any union that pursues what it ought to pursue can take a look from 1969 if they are a good union and giving their members service and an industrial plan. If it's 40% black, I'll guarantee you 95% union members. I can look at the ones that I work in and you'll see that. And if you go to organize a plant, you're going to see it. I got to get that in. I always do. Now, I didn't start on it yesterday either. Getting back to, to the housing thing, I think this, I was at a Region M meeting. A lot of money goes on in there. Mm -hmm. Title I, Title VI, you better watch yourself. If you're in, they're in every place in North Carolina. If you're in a metropolitan area, has over 100,000 population, cities handle it. If you're from the smaller counties, they double you up. I made it a point to get on that committee. I was elected to the executive committee of Region M, two counties, Harnett and Sampson County. We're talking about $780,000. You want to know where nine-tenths of it goes to? It's supposed to be for people underemployed, people who have troubles getting jobs, hardcore unemployment, and the money is used 90% to subsidize companies. I was amazed to find that Roman Haas in Federal, a big synthetic fiber plant, was using this. Kelly Springfield using this. Work a man six months. Get half of his money out of this 700 and some thousand, 759 thousand dollars. At the end of six months, lay him off. And our money has gone into subsidizing companies. You know, when you subsidize, when you use money to give to a company, you subsidize them. Then they raise hell about a little welfare, food stamps, clothing stamps. The textile workers have a plan passed out by our executive council that is much like what has been said here today by the other two gentlemen. <clears throat> by interest rates, housing, clothing stamps, <coughs> and the good brother from the building construction trade also mentioned clothing and stuff of this nature and union labels and so forth and so on. I can look in this suit of clothes and I can see a sewing machine. I know that that was made by the Malmagated Clothing Workers, a union. I don't know where in the hell the material came from. You don't know where the material came and what you're wearing either. And I'm like I.W. Abel. 
when he was presented a suit in Miami Beach by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America with a sewing machine in it. He says, I long to see the day that I want to know that that cloth was woven or that cloth was knitted in the United States when I can say that I've got a suit of clothes on that was made by American trade unionist labor. You don't know that now, and I don't know it. This stuff might have come from Taiwan, Japan, or anywhere. I don't know. It was sold over here. I have a brother-in-law's wife worked with Block Industries. They got a place out in Arizona. They sent her out there. They cut the material. Take it down to Mexico. Have it sewed. Bring it back to that plant in Arizona and distribute it here. Well, that's costing Americans jobs, isn't it? Yes, sir. We're talking about unemployment. The last figure I saw in North Carolina was 10.4. Sit down with these dudes from the Employment Security Commission and find out what it is. That 10.4 is figured on people drawing unemployment. It isn't counting people that aren't covered by it. I don't know what you would run into in North Carolina if you knew the truth and unemployment picture. It would be far higher than that. The two counties I was talking about in, in Region M of this state has trebled since November. What about people working three days that have been on a five-day schedule? That isn't reflected in an unemployment, but hell, it's 40 percent. When you cut a five-day work week down to a three-day work week, it's the same thing as laying off 40 percent of the people in that plant. Isn't reflected in any figures that they put out, though. The only figures you're going to see is people are drawing unemployment money. The, cha the chairman has been through how long it's taken you to get it in North Carolina. If you've been reading the papers, you know how long. I know people 10 weeks. I know people that were going to get evicted, moved out of their homes because they couldn't pay rent. And the state of North Carolina owing them 10 weeks. This is the kind of stuff you, we have in this thing. In this state, particular North Carolina, and I'm a native son of this state, and the only time I've ever been out of it was six years during World War II in the United States Navy. You had to have a six-year hitch then. That's the reason for that. <laughs> the Executive Council of the Textile Workers Union of America, I think, made some good recommendations, and some of them have been mentioned here today. It pointed out that there are 100,000 textile workers have lost their jobs in recent weeks. With the greatest buck concentrated in the Carolinas and Georgia, many textile employees at charge have scheduled their meals to operate a sufficient number of hours each week to prevent employees from qualifying for partial benefits. Work them three days, work them 24 hours. Don't work a full week, take a week off, get out of the employment picture. Hold your percentage down a little bit. Knocks the hell out of everything else too, doesn't it? They refuse to schedule operations to permit employees to supplement their reduced earnings with unemployment compensation. President Stanton explained, they are so concerned about keeping their unemployment insurance down that they cannot pursue a humane policy toward their employees. As a result, thousands of textile workers have been added to the ranks of the working poor. Labeling both Ford administration and Democrat proposal, Democratic proposals is inadequate. Another council resolution called for emergency action along the following lines to head off the nation's economic slide. Enacting comprehensive controls over prices, interest, dividends, and wages. You know, the last one we had, Tricky Dick picked the mic up. Fro freezing wages. 
Well, you freeze wages by just saying it. Nobody wants to give it to us anyway when we bargain for it. So we're saying that, our president is saying and council is saying what I read to you then. B, breaking up companies and guilty of price rigging. C, nationalizing industries such as medical care and health services which are not subject to the effective price control. If I get sick tonight, it's my home. It's going to cost me $22 to see a doctor. $22 to see a doctor. Because I'm going to have to go to the hospital. And they're going to charge me $9, and his fee is $13. That's $22. It isn't controlled in any way. And the bastards have got a closed shop on top of that. <laughs> Put the employees back to work by creating three million public service jobs financed by reduced military expenditures. Hell, we've got enough to overkill the world seven times here in the United States. The Pentagon screaming for more money. Building tanks that are obsolete. You saw it on television, where helicopters can just knock them out like you would swat flies down. Building them right on. Smart. Smart stuff. Then when about 60% of every, dime, every dollar we pay in taxes goes into this thing, it's a pity that people couldn't put money to humane purposes to help them instead of to destroy them. If the world wouldn't even be here today talking about anything like this. An excess profit tax and the closing of tax loopholes. Also urged was expansion of the federal food stamp program to include clothing stamps and credit subsidies for new low and middle income housing. That's the key to the whole thing to me. Conserve and develop energy resources. One, imposing quotas on imports, maintaining oil and natural gas, rationing of oil and natural gas, nationalizing the oil industry, accelerating the research and development for new category sources, and subsidizing mass transit. You know, as I started off with you, I guess textile workers are a little used to this. <laughs> but we've come a long way too. The textile industry is in the South and it, anybody that's followed the labor movement knows why. I've never really understood the paternalistic view that Southern workers have. I know this, that it takes as much skill to make a good piece of cloth as it does to make an automobile, or it does to make a refrigerator, or anything else. But when you get to textiles, you get to the lowest paid industry outside of maybe furniture that you have. The answer to that is unionization, trying to crack the big boys. And we've been trying to crack J.P. Stevens for a long, long time. And you crack him in a couple of places and they sit across the table and grin. Give you everything on the sun but a dues check off in arbitration. That's a one-way ticket to hell. All right. That's what it is. One-way ticket to hell. I'm glad to see that some changes have been made in this, in this state. And I would reiterate, with a 7.5% organized, 
My God, if we had 50%, we could turn this thing around. Overnight. Be any, no problems at all. I think this state organization has done a good job. For I think that you are receiving, and I think my local union is receiving, a good dividend on what we're putting into it. It's going to take a combination of all of us working together to get over there. I learned a long time ago that there's no such word as, as economics without the word political in front of it. Political economics is the name of the game, and it's been said here by the two preceding people who talked. I'd like to wind up by telling you a little joke of people working together to do something, and I'm going to sit down. Seems this boy and girl got married, and it isn't too bad. And he had a talking parrot, talked a lot, couldn't keep his mouth shut, been taken back down to the zoo about a half a dozen times, people wouldn't keep him. So they painted the car up for him and everything, they couldn't drive. So they went to a nearby motel and he called the garage and told them to come over and fix his car. He'd already had it agreed that with his bride that he could take the parrot along. He didn't have anybody to keep with him. So they prepared for bed and hung the cage up in the corner. And the parrot was given a blow-by-blow -blow description of everything that was going on. He's doing so-and-so. She's reacting so-and-so. So he gets up to him and he comes to him with a threat. Look at him, buddy. If you don't keep your mouth shut, he says, I'm taking you back to the zoo. Goes back to bed. The parrot gives us the Clem McCarthy style blow-by-blow -blow description of it you remember the radio fights he gave. Everything that was going on, he was telling. So the bride said, go into the toilet and get a bath towel and throw over him and see if that'll help. So she did. He did. Got black. He figured everything was quiet. He didn't see anything, so he couldn't talk. He goes to sleep. He wakes up. It's morning, but he's covered up, and it's dark, and he still thinks it's night. And the bride and groom are packing. And he says, you get on top, but they're trying to get that suitcase closed. He says, you get on top, and try it. And we'll try it that way. The parrot's ears perk up. He says, that ain't going to work. He says, let me get on top and try. Perks up a little bit more. He says, that ain't going to work either. He says, let's both get on top and try. <laughs> and the parrot grabbed that towel by his beak, threw it away, and he said, zoo or no zoo, this I've got to see. <laughs> so, you know, there's a little moral of that, too that we're going to have to work together. And this is what this is all about. This is why we ought to be down supporting the ERA this afternoon, because they're going to try to get people there that outweigh at your own meeting. This is for proponents today. We ought to get people there when the opponents to ERA have that thing. We've got the tools to do it. The tools are people. Industry can't move without people. So I ask you to go back to your local unions and let's get together. White power, black power, and as Howard Lee says, green power. That's the money. That's what it takes. Whites, black, and some money, and you can get the job done. All Thank right. you.
Thank you, Lloyd. The next speaker for us is Robert Whitley, who's president of the CWA local here in Raleigh, and he's going to talk about the economy and its effect on the communication media, uh, communication workers here in North Carolina. Robert Whitley. <coughs> Thank you, Wilbur. I'm not going to say too much because Wayne Gray was supposed to give the presentation for uh, CWA and Wilbur asked me in Wayne's absence about 10 minutes ago to say a word or two to you. And uh, first of all, I'd like to point out to you that CWA is made up of industries other than uh, Southern Bell, but I can only speak with very little authority for Southern Bell. I don't know what the layoff situation in the rest of the uh, CWA is. But uh, Lloyd, I'd like to start off with a little short joke here. I don't think anybody's going to sleep on me, so I won't have to wake them up later, but uh, we all in all of our industries, I reckon, got a joke or two, and this one is real short, and it was about two ladies were talking, and one asked the other one, she said, I said, can you talk to your husband while you're making love? And the lady thought about it a while, and she said, yeah, I sure can. So the telephone's right next to the bed. But uh, we're, we're finding this is not the case anymore because a lot of people are, are taking out their telephones and we are, we in the communications industry thought for a long time that we were kind of elite, I guess, in that we would never be confronted with these problems. But we found out last November that we were as vulnerable as anybody else to uh, the economic ills of the country and we were notified last November that Southern Bell due to a uh, decline in sales of telephone equipment uh, it was necessary to uh, lay off or part-time our employees so at that time we agreed with the company that uh, we would part-time uh, part of our employees and this has been going on since December of last year we've had employees working five days one week and four days the next week and a lot of people don't realize that we don't brag about it but we found out that this wouldn't uh, cure the situation so it it was announced uh, Tuesday of last week that there would be further layoffs in Southern Bell and specifically here in North Carolina we have a uh, 190 additional people to be laid off uh, starting next Tuesday. This will bring Southern Bell's total thus far of layoffs up to 2,000 for the four states that they represent, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. I don't have any kind of percentages, but I'm sure it's a whole lot smaller than some of the other industries. And the communications industry, uh, just like the textile industry, is uh, directly affected by the construction industry and we normally lag about six months behind the decline in the construction industry and the impact of it has just hit us. So uh, if the building trades can go back to work, we'll be all for that. We found out when we got into uh, this uh, lack of work situation or force adjustment situation that we're in that uh, the wording of our contract was kind of outdated. The, this portion of our working agreement was uh, written in 1945, and just to show you how immune we thought we were to it, we haven't changed that language since then. So we're trying to handle a situation today with language that was written 30 years ago, and we, we found out it's just not uh, appropriate for the situation we're in. And that's about all I can uh, give you on it, Wilbur, at this time. Another one of our large industries in North Carolina is the paper workers, and we have the vice president for the United Paper Workers International Union with us today, Arnold Brown, to speak on unemployment and the economy in the paper industry. Arnold? Let me say to you, Arnold, a vice president in Virginia, but is a strong <laughs> supporter of the state AFL-CIO and the local central labor unions in that area. 
Thank you, Mr. President and fellow trade unionists uh, from the state of North Carolina. First, I was listening to the music next door, and I think uh, golf is having a ban that while the treasurers of the Gulf Oil Company carries their money to the bank. And we're here talking about unemployment in the state of North Carolina and what the industries here are paying to our people. And I certainly want to talk about our industry, which consists of one of the largest industries in this state and one of the higher paid. But I think after we talk about our wages being high paid, if we're unemployed, it doesn't have any effect upon us. My good friend and brother from the building trades mentioned uh, uh, the saying about your next door neighbor being unemployed and you being unemployed. I remember who said that and that Harry Truman made that statement and I think he was so right today. And as I travel around the three states that I have, uh, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina, and the District of Columbia, I find that we really are in a depression, but most of our workers that are working today do not realize that. And I think that it's our job as labor leaders to get out into the field and take a look at what's going on today so that we can inform our working members what the real facts of life are today in this economy that we live in. I have some facts in reference and I'll try to stick basically to the paper industry. The economy in our industry continues to reflect the conditions the same as the national economy. Later I will give you some figures which indicates the massive layoffs as it does not appear that the situation will improve in the near future. A year ago Shortages exist in every category from pulp to finished converted products in our industry. This was followed by inventories being brought to a maximum to ensure a continuous supply to escape further inevitable price increases. And I might say at this point, the paper companies are not reducing prices one bit. They're increasing prices and they're closing down the plants for two weeks at a time without reducing prices to keep the price up because they assume Congress may do something in reference to this. Now, employees on, the, on paper and allied products payrolls as of January 1974 in our industry were 713,000. In January 1975, it was 665,000 down 48,000 less workers now are employed in our industry. This was January 1st. The average weekly hours in January 1974 was 42.9 hours worked. In January 1975, it was 41.2, down 1.7 work hours. Now while 1.7 hours does not appear to be a large figure, but taken on the balance and apply it to the entire industry, this represents a tremendous reduction in production and also in earnings, as the next figures I will give you clearly demonstrates. The average hourly earnings in January 1975 for paper workers across the nation was $4.73 per hour. In January 1974, the average was $4.33 an hour. The difference being 40 cents an hour or from $193.46 a week in 1975 to $184.46 in 1974. While there has been an increase of 40 cents an hour on the average, this generates $16 a week in earnings. The average increase has only gone up $9 in one year, which represents an increase of 22 and a half cents rather than the 40 cents increase. These figures cited do not reflect the number of plants that are now working less than five days per week. In North Carolina, our international union represents 8,500 union members and 25 local unions across this state. Most of the white paper mills are running seven days a week with few layoffs. And these are the mills that are making milk carton stock 
writing paper of all sorts, magazine paper, and what have you. In the converting plants, we have layoffs and short work weeks, some three-day weeks, but mostly four-day weeks. The craft mills have gone down with large layoffs, especially in Roanoke Rapids. We're out of about 550 people at that craft mill of the Albemarle Paper Company. We have about 150 laid off. Of course, this is one of the, Horner Waldorf basically owns this company, but it's being run out of Roanoke Rapids at the present time. They're requiring these 150 people to meet the shift once each day, five days a week, and if they do not do that, they're not allowing them to draw unemployment. Of course, this is all tied into a long-standing EEOC problem that we have in that location. Now, our large cigarette paper manufacturing plant at Pisgah Forest, which makes 70 percent of the cigarette paper made in the world, and I suppose the reason the cigarette machines, we have 12 paper machines there, that nine of them are on cigarette paper, I suppose that their, the reason that they're continuing to run at full blast is because so many people are smoking more today than ever before because they're worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow in our economy. But I was just told this week that we have 175 that will be laid off on other machines there that are not on, on cigarette paper, on other white paper that will be laid off this week out of some 1,675. Now, the pulp mill at Newburn, North Carolina, which is local 1167 of our union, has been on strike since at midnight on January the 31st. And I certainly would ask the delegation here today, and if you have any friends that are not here today, that these people do need your moral support, they need your financial support in that situation, because that happens to be one of the finest pulp mills in the nation, owned by one of the largest paper companies in our industry, which is the Weyerhaeuser Corporation. Now, they report in the recent pulp and paper magazine that they only earned uh, $276.2 million in 1974. They're down 21 percent. In other words, they're minus 21 percent over 1973. But 1973, they earned 400, and, excuse me, 349.6 million, as compared to, say, uh, Scott Paper Company, who was up 71 percent in 1974. So these paper companies are getting rich, and Weyerhaeuser can certainly stand to settle with us at this Newburn operation for what we're asking for because it's only their lumber and plywood operation where the losses are coming from and it's not in the pulp and paper industry that they're losing money. And I also have a report the president of George Weyerhaeuser of, of the Weyerhaeuser Corporation predicts that the pulp paper board and paper operations in the United States and his company will produce in 1975 at the rate between 90 and 98 percent of capacity. Now, if we produce it in our industry at the rate of 95 percent of capacity, we consider that 100 percent. So he does predict, and I do not agree with his prediction based upon what I see at the present time as far as our industry is concerned. The thing that bothers me most in our industry today is the question of oil and natural gas and no one has mentioned this at the, up to this time. And just when the sh shortage will hit our paper mills, I do not know. But it has hit in some areas of Virginia and North Carolina. Also, it is the gas prices, gasoline prices. If they're increased, this will certainly cut the earning power of our members, such, since many of our members live a great distance from the plants that they work in, and many of them are on short work weeks now working in our converting operations. 
The paper companies may have the orders to run, but if oil and natural gas is not available, our plants will certainly go down. The main product to keep a paper mill running today is wood, water, oil, coal, chemicals and gas, and of course, manpower. In closing, in my opinion, the whole economy is judged on the corrugated box industry since most of all of the industries depend upon the corrugated boxes for shipping. In our industry, we look at the corrugated box industry first to tell where, where we're going, and it is the hardest hit at the present time. I do not know of one corrugated box plant in, in any state that I represent of the 22,000 people that is in my area that is run, running more than four days a week. As I said before, most of our plants in this industry are on three and four days per week. The government calls these employed workers, but living today on three days per week is poverty wages, in my opinion. For us as labor leaders to map a program to put America back to work, we're going to have to get into the field and see just how workers are living today and what their real problems are and get to our congressmen and our senators and let them know where we stand as laboring people on behalf of the unemployed because the unemployed are not able to get, in most cases, to the congressmen. I have seen this and I feel in closing that this is a disaster to America and to the labor movement unless we do something about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnold. Now, we had invited Harold McIver, the Southeastern Coordinator for the Industrial Union Department, who's sort of heading up most of the organizing campaigns for textile in this state and other unions, uh, to be here and speak on the uh, recession and its effect on organizing, but I haven't seen Harold. Is Harold out there? No. Needless to say, the, the depression or the recession, whichever you desire to call it, is having a great effect on our organizing efforts. And it's causing uh, a lot of those people where we're having organizing campaigns who've already been instilled with fear over the year when jobs are as scarce as they are and unemployment compensation is as low as it is, there's a great deal more fear there now than, ever, than it was before, and it's having an effect. It isn't stopping us. We're still going in and we're still trying, and it doesn't have an effect on everybody because I met with a group who lost an election a couple of weeks ago at that plant, those two plants of J.S. B. Stevens down in Wallace, North Carolina. And I've never seen a more enthusiastic group who met tonight after the election had been lost that day. And these young people were. And so the spirit of the trade union movement is still in them. And we're going to have to continue our organizing efforts in those areas. Now to wind up the part of our conference of the Put America Back to Work, the chair has sat here and drafted a resolution which he wants to submit in behalf of the executive board of the state AFL-CIO to the conference. Whereas the general executive board of the AFL-CIO met in Washington, D.C. on January 23, 1975, in emergency session to discuss the threat posed by recession and unemployment and to formulate a program to combat these twin evils. And whereas the general executive board is composed of the elected president of each international and national union that is affiliated with the AFL-CIO, plus the directors of the various departments of the AFL-CIO, is and is in fact in the in fact the top leadership of our trade union movement. And whereas the president of the 50 state AFL-CIO organizations were invited to participate in the general executive board meeting and to provide input into the conference agenda and conclusions and whereas the emergency meeting adopted a program to, quote, put America back to work, unquote, that includes the following points. One, a tax cut of $15 billion that go to low and moderate income people. <laughs> Two, to make the United States independent of a rare blackmailers of oil. 
three, to reduce interest rates to 6%, four, to release $19 billion of funds impounded by Presidents Nixon and Ford, and five, to restrict the imports of goods whose U.S. production has declined and to limit exports of goods which are in short domestic supply in the United States, six, to extend unemployment compensation benefits by eliminating the waiting week and putting a federal floor of two-thirds of the average weekly wage. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the North Carolina State Amp of LCO Convention to Put America Back to Work, being held in Raleigh on March 4, 1974, does strongly endorse the program to, quote, put America back to work, unquote, adopted by the General Executive Board of the AF of LCIO, and be it further resolved that the North Carolina State AF of LCIO call upon all its affiliated local unions to endorse and support the AF of LCIO program to put America back to work by writing and contacting their U.S. Senators, Congressmen, the President, the Governor, the Lieutenant Governor, and the elected members of the North Carolina General Assembly, and by requesting their support of this program, respectfully submitted by Wilbur Hobby, in behalf of the North Carolina State Air Bell Seattle Executive Board. What's the pleasure of the body? Been duly, been duly moved and seconded that the motion be adopted. Is there a discussion? Hearing no discussion, the question's been called for. All in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. I ought to give that the way I heard they did in the meeting the other day. That everybody in favor of the motion say right on. <laughs> All opposed say wait a minute. <laughs> the right on's have been so ordered. Let me, uh, let me just say I think we ought to do probably two other things here. Uh, number one, I think we ought to send the President of the United States a copy or a telegram from this con conference right here uh, telling him that we have met and that the 300 delegates registered here at this convention have unanimously adopted a resolution in support of the AFL CIO program to put America back to work. The chair will entertain such a motion. Uh, Been duly moved and seconded that a telegram be sent to the President and to President Meany with a copy to President Meany of this action taken. Is there further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, the question has been called for. All in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have and so ordered. Delbert, we got a little partial report, but we didn't get a full report from the communication workers. If you'd like to come, Delbert's been out working on some of the layoffs and is back now. Needless to say, we'll have a, a news release on this action taken here by the convention today and a copy of the resolution for the press. Right on, right on David. Delbert Gordon, the Western North Carolina Director for CWA. I'm very sorry I was late. Uh, I thought it was more important to work on the problem rather than come up here and tell you about it. And that's what I've been doing. Uh, I don't know what has been said. I hadn't had the opportunity to be here and listen to all the problems of all the industries and such as for the layoffs. But I'm sure that all of you know, the, whew, I'm a little bit out of breath, the telephone industry or the communication industry certainly depends on all the others. And when people are out of work, the first thing they do is to look at their budget and see the first thing they can cut. And they certainly have priorities. And those priorities are developed in order of food, housing, and sometimes an automobile to find work, and the telephone is something they look at to get rid of first. And in the communication industry, we have uh, problems, not necessarily in Southern Bell, but we have them in all the areas of the communications workers. We have the, when, when people start canceling their telephones, that affects not only the, the, the telephone company itself, but it affects the suppliers. So we're having problems with the suppliers as well, which is Western Electric. Western Electric makes the equipment. People don't use the equipment, they quit making it. So we're having layoffs, just like all the other industries have. We're having layoffs in the suppliers, independent companies, as well as the bell system. And when the, when the textile workers, the furniture workers, the auto workers, when these people are out of jobs, the first thing they do is cancel their telephone, or at least maybe the second thing. And so when they start canceling their telephones, 
people are out of job in the communication industry because that's what they do. They put your telephones in and repair them and, 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 and take care of them. And so when you're out of a job, they are too. And so I just want you to know that uh, if the building industry starts picking up, auto workers start going back to work, textile workers and the furniture workers start going back to work, then our problems will be over. Thank you very much. Now we're getting down to where we're going to have to adjourn. We got two more speakers, and I think we had a couple of guests that I wanted to to uh, announce that we're here. And then if you have any problem, you could see them on adjournment. We have with us today an old friend of mine from Georgia, his former business agent of the IBW local there in Atlanta, J.W. Giles, and J.W. is the safety program liaison officer. That's the OSHA representative. Uh, working with the labor movement out of the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration in Atlanta, and I'd like for J.W. to stand up. And those of you, there are a couple of people in the Boilermakers, I know, that talked about a new thing. <laughs> J.W. will be available for any of you who have any problems or want to discuss anything, and he, he helps put on programs in the local unions and in the central labor unions in regards to the OSHA program, he'll be back at the back of the hall uh, when we adjourn today. Now, we have with us uh, the best friend we've got in the North Carolina General Assembly, and I know he's got to get over there for the session that starts at 1 o'clock, but Tom Sawyer's been a friend of mine for the last 24 years. Uh, when we first elected him to the Senate in Durham in 1950, and he's now a member of the House of Representatives from Guilford County, has introduced our mass transit legislation for the transit workers already uh, in this session. Last session, he was the man that introduced the agency shop bill and is a full supporter of practically every piece of legislation that the North Carolina State FLCO has endorsed and one of our, uh, not one of our best friends, our best friend, North Carolina General Assembly. And I'd like to recognize Tom for some brief remarks, Tom. Thank you very much, Wilbur, Mr. President, and members of the AFL-CIO unions, locals, and also the members of the central labor unions. Uh, whenever I got started here, Wilbur cautioned me, said, I want you to limit what you say because the folks here want to get over to the General Assembly. Well, I have to get over there, too. <laughs> and uh, so bearing that in mind, I do want to touch on just a few things here. And as I've said so many times before, if I don't leave any other tracks on this world after I leave here, I want to be remembered for one thing, that I was a champion of labor. <laughs> it was a right amusing little incident this morning. Someone who keeps me pretty well informed of the scuttlebutt over there around the General Assembly said one of the rather pompous legislators, you know the type, I am a member of the Committee on Banking, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and made a crack saying that uh, he noticed that I associated with a number of people in organized labor. And he said whenever he saw that, that he always put him down as being for labor. Well, he didn't know it, but he paid me a great compliment. So let's look at a few things that we have here, number one is that we are in a bad situation. There's no question about that, but we're not in such a bad situation that we can't fight our way out if we get a little bit of, of leadership from our federal government. And one of the main things is, and I heard Franklin D. Roosevelt decry this time and time again, and I want to tell you that he was, and still is, one of my greatest heroes of history. And the thing that I heard him decry time and time again was the Wall Street bankers and what they were trying to do. And I think all of us are aware now that by their policies, they don't care who they crush, they don't care who they smash. 
And I think that Arthur Burns, who is chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, has had his say too long. He has been calling the shots as far as the economy of this country is concerned. And it's time for him to go. Amen. So let's see what they've been doing. All right, the bankers have raised their interest rates. They keep on raising them. And the pitiful excuse that they have is they say, well, prices are going up and interest ought to go up too. But what they are denying and what they are concealing is this, that let's say that there is a house that was going for $10,000 and the inflated price of that house now is $20,000. If they're charging 6% on that money that they charge you and I, they are still doubling their money. Doesn't that make sense? But they're not satisfied with that. What they want to do is to charge four times as much. Because what they have in mind is to get the interest rate and stabilize it, if they can, at 12%. Because it, it costs the average businessman today 12% to go out and get any kind of a commercial loan. So it's very easy to see what's going on. And Mr. Meany, the president of AFL-CIO, has urged this to be done, and I hope that you will back him to the hilt. Let's put some, some teeth into this thing, and everybody get behind it, and it's going to have to be done with federal legislation is to bring the interest rate back to 6% and declare that anything over and above that is usury. Because anything, <clears throat> That is usurious, it's, it's just another name for thievery. That's all the world it amounts to. So I hope you'll get behind it and stay behind it. Another thing that we have which is a problem, and you'll probably hear something about statements that I've made on it. I don't know what the newspapers will do to it, but it pertains to no-fault insurance. All in the world that I'm trying to do is to keep this bill that goes through, and I think we probably will come up with some sort of a bill this time. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I think, it, I think I got it now, is simply to keep it from being an insurance company bill because it is fraught with danger if we let them get through what they want. And I'm quoting from a book here which is entitled No Fault Insurance by one of the authorities on it, Dr. Willis Pott of the University of Nebraska. And this is what he says. He says, critics of the state approach to no fault insurance argue that they're is enormous profit potential for the insurance companies in no-fault insurance today. So please keep that in mind. We want to get some sort of a bill through which will be consumer-oriented, which will be for the benefit of the people, not just for the insurance companies, because let's point to Massachusetts, which pioneered the field. In the first year, that they had no fault insurance in the state of Massachusetts, they cut the number of claims down that they paid exactly in half, and they reaped a windfall of profits. And I think there's been too much of this windfall of profits, as you well know, whether it be insurance, or whether it be in the oil business, or whether it be in banking. And that's where all the money's going today. So what they're trying to do, you see, is simply to eliminate the middle class. And when I say middle class, the working people of this country have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps to get into the middle class, and now the bankers and the oil cartels and the big boys are trying desperately to drive them back down. They want to crush, they want to eliminate the middle class. And let's stop it. Let's put a stop to it. So some of the things we want to do, just to summarize quickly, is number one is to get the sales tax off food. And this, I'm sure, can we be done and we can pick up the slack by several things, by removal of the sales tax exemptions. Too long people have been able to buy new Cadillacs and new yachts and new boats uh, in the range of ten to twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars and they don't have to pay tax on it. And yet if the average worker buys food in the amount of two or three thousand dollars a year, he has to pay sales tax on every bit of that food. So it's just not just, it's not right for this loophole to be in the law. 
Another one is to tax corporate dividends in the state of North Carolina. This can be done. They've had that loophole in the North Carolina tax structure. There can also be an increase on the tax on beer, wine, and whiskey. There can also be an increase on income tax, which is going to have to be done in the higher level income brackets of fifteen, twenty, and twenty-five thousand dollars. So bear these things in mind, ask for them, demand them if you have to. A couple of things that I've been interested in, and I was happy to introduce your bill on the Mass Transit Collective Bargaining Bill, which simply does this. It makes federal funds, which you and I have already paid in our taxes, it makes available those funds in the state of North Carolina for the operation of mass transit systems by the municipalities and all in the world that my bill will do is to ensure that under the existing contracts which private industry has in the operation of transit systems, the same benefits for collective bargaining, for health benefits, and for retirement benefits will be given to those workers. And I got a letter this morning that the League of Municipalities wants to appear before the Committee on Labor and Banking to oppose that. Now, who is controlling the League of Municipalities? I want to ask you. And then the other one that I fought for, and I'll, fought, uh, and I'll fight for it again, is the agency shop bill, which <laughs> it simply does this, and I can't understand what the opposition is, is to guarantee that people who have problems, that is, if, if they, they need collective bargaining, and if they need uh, bargaining for their benefits and their retirement. As you very well know, if that is a, a unionized company, that the union has to represent the union members and the non-members alike. And all in the world that we are asking for is that the non-union members pay for their proportionate share of expense for someone representing them, bargaining for them, looking after their rights. And if it were not for organized labor, if it were not for the AFL-CIO, they would not have any rights. Thank you. It's from the heart. I enjoyed being with you. <laughs> All I'm asking is 61 representatives like that down there in the House and 26 senators, and I'll give you everything you want. We've got to rush along, but since Harold McIver's not here, and I didn't know it at the time, Al Motley was here from IUD, uh, representing the Industrial Union Department. I'd like for Al to stand up. Uh, Harold called him from Tampa, Florida, where they're organizing uh, Florida Steel down there, and they got a uh, tough company. It's got plant in Charlotte, which they've already organized, plant in Jacksonville, the plant in Tampa. And Harold's down there because the election's drawing near, and he asked Al to come by. And Al said he thought I covered that part of it right, right well, but Al, I would like for you to stand. All right, thank you. Al Martin. <laughs> thought about a wind-up speaker, and I guess, uh, Hank, you're going to have to go some uh, to beat our representative we got here. You got anything like that in Texas since got Barbara one, lived in Washington? Got one animal like that left. <laughs> one animal like that left. I want to introduce to you our good friend Hank Brown, the former president of the state NFL CIO in the state of Texas, and now vice president of that all union insurance company, the American Income Life Insurance Company. Hank. Thank you very much. <laughs> the last time we met was just before we had a chance to stop all this crap. We had the chance in October 
We had the chance to choose between McGovern, that was for working people, was for the Democratic Party, that stood tall, that believed in nationwide abolishment of the right to work. And we got confused, we got misled, we got to watch the idiot stick, that thing they call the television. Got to watch it, he's slick, good looking, Yale, handsome, clean shaven, business types. Fellas like John Connolly, good, clean, honest man like Tricky Dicky, a nice, clean fellow like Agnew Spyro, who takes it under the table while John's getting it on top. That is, until he got his foot caught in the milk can down there. We had good, clean choice types like Mr. Mitchell. That nice, clean, audible gentleman of the bar and a lion SOB if you ever met one in your life. <laughs> now, if you think, by God, I'm mad, it's because I am. I've been 50,000 miles this year. I've been in seven states in four days, and this is going on all over the country. I've crossed this country five times since a week ago on Monday. Just trying to get you to wake up. I don't give a damn. Sophie Brown's got all the money I need. I got 26 acres in Texas that paid for. I got three kids that are doing damn good. All I'm working. But I'm hurting. My business is hurting. We can't sell insurance to the head of our CIO. Workers of America, and the first thing they cut off is not the telephone. By God, it's their insurance premium. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Now, when George Bailey said last week on Meet the Press that we ought to reduce the money in this country available for everybody that needs it to 6%, our President Barney Rappaport said, Hank, what do you think? I said, send George a telegram. Tell him, Mr. Bailey, we pledge 5% of the total assets of American income life and 6% for any construction job in America that uses union and workers. And if every company, <laughs> if every company in America, there are billions of dollars laying around. And for 30 years, I run up and down the state of Texas and elsewhere, custody insurance companies. Now that I'm a union executive, I've merely learned that everything we said about them dirty, stinking, thieving, cheating, rascals is true. <laughs> right. And I got the record now to prove it. Because I am the executive vice president of a $60 million corporation, and I know how much comes in, and I know how much goes out, and we pay out twice the premium we're back to our claims than any other company in America and can prove it, and we're still making 8% on every dollar that comes through our hand. Now imagine what's happening to Prudential and all the Big Ten and New York Live. 10% of the giants have got control of the industry. The rest of the companies like we are are out there fighting like a mad pack of dogs over a bone. It's true in every industry. It's the multinationals that are killing us. You know why there's no money in this country at 8%? It's because they can loan it out in the foreign countries for 12 and 20. So why in the hell should they give it to us, Brother Sailor? Why should they give it to us? But you're going to have to do some things, ladies and gentlemen. We had the choice, and we made a mistake. Texas made a mistake. We voted for an idiot named Nixon, a thief, a liar, a cheat, a knave, a crook, and so did Carolina. And so when you want to know who is to blame for some of your trouble, well, my father-in-law was an old Dutchman. He learned to plumb and trade in a union shop in Germany. And he was president of the local for 20 years when I grew up as a plumber. And he said a lot of times when we'd make a mistake, like one time we went on strike, and we had to go back to work for $2 less than we had struck for after six weeks. And he said, oh, I'm going to told you you'll go home tonight. Are you looking to me? I thought you see us one great big jackass. See? <laughs> now, I hope, brothers and sisters, that when we get a chance in 1976 that we don't get misled by some smooth, talking, slick, Yale-educated type, that we don't get misled by the New York writers that said, you don't want a fellow vote for that fellow like McGovern girls. I'm not going to go all the way. I just got to get comfortable because I don't feel comfortable, you know. <laughs>
Uh, what are you doing in the meantime? So we made a mistake. We voted for all them knaves and crooked, and the court has upheld us. We got misled. We didn't want a guy that was for abortion, would we? Except the Supreme Court said it's legal. It's all going on right now, all over the land. Now, we wouldn't want a fellow that was for smoking marijuana, and hell, half the kids in the country are doing a hell of a lot worse than that. And where did they learn? They learned from us. <laughs> You know, you watch some of your own folks and the adult habits and see how they're treating one another. You wonder why the kids are on a drug kick. But let me tell you, that ain't the greatest problem in America. The greatest problem in America is the Republican Party. They have done this to America. The drug addiction is right here because the prices are up and the wages are down. The imports are up and the dollar is down. The interest is up and the stocks are down. The profits are up and the real income is down. The budget is up and the jobs are down. The welfare is up and the opportunity to work is down. And I say to you what Lincoln was the last good Republican that walked the face of America. And as soon as the worker of this country understands that, now our problem is that when we get a full belly, we start thinking that we're part of the country club. We get a, first thing you know, you got a bumper hitch on the back of your car. And you got a boat that is not paid for yet. You start driving out to some resort on the weekend, and you stop going to union meetings and find out what the hell's going on. And you get tattooed and barbecued. All them freeloaders we got in the labor movement, we got them. Why, there's a third of the labor movement in Carolina ain't paying no per capita here. They're not here today. They're letting you carry the load. We ought to get back in. I remember Henry Gonzalez, you check his record. He's like that brother Sawyer. He's been in the Congress 10 years, and he's got a voting record looks like ivory soap. 99 and 94 100 percent pure. You can't hardly do much better than that. And Henry tells a story that's true for Carolina while you're considering this problem. He says, Hank, you like to hunt? I said, yes, sir. I go every time I can. He said, you ever hunt South Texas? That's down in the cactus country. No trees, a lot of cactus, a lot of good deer, a lot of quail, a lot of rattlesnakes also. He said, now, Hank, when you go down there, you want to take your very best friend. I said, how do you mean that? He said, I mean a friend that you can trust beyond any question. I said, why do I need such a good friend just to go hunting? I said, well, you be going along down there, one of them snakes you reach out there and bite you on the hand. That ain't no problem. I said, you just whip out your knife, you cut you a couple of slashes, you suck that blood. All you do down your leg. But if that snake ever bites you where you sit, you better have your one hell of a friend, you know. <laughs> And then again, they got these, these politicians that run around looking like they're your friend, not like Brother Sawyer. He's been down the road with you. You've got his record. You judge them by the record and not how they sound on the tube. Why, they got all these slick riders today. You can't tell friend from foe. Why, hell, with enough money, you can make Hank Brown look good on TV. And I do know. It kind of reminds you of the time I'd been hunting down this little place I told you out right near Bandera, Texas. I was on my way back one day, and a uh, big fat cat right up the Cadillac, boom, hit me riding my best horse, Whitey, knocked me and Whitey off in the ditch, had my best horse, dog blue with me, broke his back. Right behind him come the sheriff with that red light, a whirling along, jumped out there, run up there, he could see that my old Whitey had a broken neck, so he did a decent thing, he put a bullet through him. Put him out of his misery. Run over that old blue and he could tell blue's back was broken. Did the same thing. Run over there and put a bullet through him. Run over to me with that gun in his hand. Said, Hank, how you feel? I said, I feel great. You know, I feel good. <laughs> we have got two ladies and gentlemen. I carry my card, my pocket of card for 34 years in the Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Union. And I'm damn proud of it. I'd go to hell before I let somebody ever take that card. My old man died with a 38-year card. And the steel workers, the CIO, and the United Mine Workers Union before that. My mother retired as president of her local union. My son is a member of the Teamsters. My other son is a member of the Plumbers. My daughter is a member of the CWA. Now raising children, so I understand she got to withdraw temporarily. 
So they're losing that seven, eight dollars a month dues. We'll try to get her back as soon as they get through this kid. But my point is, you got to get close together in this kind of a fight. Now go over there and raise hell. Don't be too nice. You put them folks in office and tell them, by God, what you need. Tell it to them so plain that they understand it. I remember 50,000 women one day when Rosa Walker got on TV and said, Women, come by plane, come by train, come by mule train. If you'll come to Austin, the Philadelphia Isle will pay your bill, your fare. There was 50,000 gals showed up. It was the damnest Bee Lee you ever saw in your life. Women with fur coats and women ain't got no coat. It's a cold, damn miserable day and the good Lord was on our side. It was a raining so everybody was mad. They started out the breakfast, hiring the governor in effigy right in front of his house. And they were looking for him to substitute him for the dummy. <laughs> they went over to that legislature and by three o'clock the Texas Rangers came over hollering it was a bomb scare. You had to get out. Women were coming and going. Looked like the WPA. Two coming, two going, two doing you know what, and two more. All over the place. And I'll tell you what, the representative that had passed it through the Senate asked for special privilege at 4 o'clock and denounced the Senate for having the dastardly condition to pass that damn bill and withdrew it. He never mentioned that he was the mother that wrote it up in the first place. <laughs> so don't be too sweet. Now I know Weber's going to tell you to be a gentleman, but you can't be a gentleman. The action that squeaks gets the grease. Now, I've read the FLC. I was with them when they adopted it in Miami. And I'm privileged still to be a member of the advisory council uh, working with Al Barkin. And whenever there's an election going on, we're going to be there. Just like when you issued the call and you said you needed money. We called our agents and said, get Wilbur a thousand dollars down there. Said, why? I said, because if he don't get them people back to work, you ain't going to sell no insurance. And if you don't sell some insurance, you're not going to be with us very damn long. And he got the check down the next day. <laughs> so we got a selfish interest. But more than that, you can't spend your life. Have I been privileged? It's a boy on a picket line in some jail, screaming and billing and hollering, and then all of a sudden you're enjoying a good life and you quit. Well, you're just people not built like that. Right, quick, all you want is a $20 billion tax relief. Number two, we ought to take the whole damn oil industry and federalize it and put it in the hands of the people. Number three, we ought to stop meeting out and tell the Congress, reduce the interest rate to 6%. And if they don't want to furnish money like that, by God, there are others that will. And I'll tell you they will, because these businessmen are grubby. They love money, and they'll do it. And if 6% is what the deal is, they'll damn sure lend it at 6%. They did it before. Half of the people unemployed are going to run out of benefits before the sun gets real hot in Texas. It ain't exactly cool right now, because by, by the time it's 100, Michigan's going to be out of money. Can you imagine a half a million families, no job, no food stamps, and no unemployment check? They'll be riding the street. They'll make what our black brothers and sisters did a few years ago to get the attention of America and to make them realize that every man has got to have a chance. They'll make this country steam. So let's try it like ladies and gentlemen. Let's ask the politician to get up off of your Kamasiyama and put America back to work. And we'll explain that word to you tonight at the banquet if anybody <laughs> don't understand. Let's tell them we don't want no more hanky-panky, no double-dealing. Resolutions ain't going to get America back to work. You know it. Why, we had a case just last week, and well, I'm going to quit, believe it or not. I get so wound up and so excited, I just can't stop, but I promise you, I'm going to quit. And this man had obviously jumped or was pushed out of this 20-story building there in San Antonio where I live. And of course they're looking to see what's happened because there's a mob down there. They see a window, it's kind of got no screen and they run up there and they walk in and here's this beautiful woman sitting there naked as a jaybird. And they say, ma'am, you know anything about this? I said, well, 
I know all about it. Said, I met this fellow at a political meeting about two months ago, and he said, lady, I'd like for you to come to work for me for $250 as a receptionist. And I tell him, no hanky panky. He said, no hanky panky. We shook on the deal. I took the job because it was 100 bucks a week, more than I'd been making. Said, I'd been here about a week, and he said, you're such a beautiful woman. I'd like for you to come topless, and it was an extra 100 a week. I said, no hanky-panky. He said, no hanky-panky. We shook on it, another hundred a week. I just got to sit there and look pretty all day. That wasn't a bad deal. <coughs> the last week he came in and said, you are such a beautiful woman. Uh, I'll give you another hundred a week if you just come in nude. So I thought, well, hundred a week. No hanky-panky. No hanky-panky. We shook on it. This morning he came in, and would you believe it? He said, I'm tired of it all. What I want to know is how much is hanky-panky. I told him $20 and he went right out the damn window. <laughs> All right. We know the problem. The fat cats, the money grubbers, the bankers, the insurance types, and Hank Brown ain't going to get you back to work. Wilbur Hobby and the kind of dedicated men you heard here, Brother Sala, Brother Media, the Infobel CIO, they've got the program for America. You've got to just push and shove and bitch and scream and holler. And remember, who was with you next election day? And don't get carried away by that slick, good-looking mother on that tube. <laughs> Look at the record. That's how you know the good book told you that, by their deeds. Ye shall know them, and if you don't have that much sense, then really it's too much late for me to do anything for you. In the meantime, well, we thank you for letting me come. I like to raise hell. I like to sign off. I'm rich enough today that ain't nobody can hurt me except Sophie Brown, and I'm going home to see her tonight. <laughs> but I'll leave you with this thought. Everything worthwhile, we paid a hell of a price. We spilled blood for it, and that's how this whole country was born, in the spirit of revolution. Right. I fear that there'll be blood spilt before America's back to work. I pray it will not be too many or that it's yours personally. But if that's what we've got to do to get a hold of the money grubbers and run them out of the temple, run them out of the temple like Jesus Christ did, then that's the price we've got to pay. Because I pray and say to you that if this problem is not resolved come the fourth day of July, when we are celebrating nearly the 199th year of our independence, there will be blood all over America of the unemployed. Because I'm used to going hungry. I grew up hungry in a shack at the edge of a coal mine in town and just pray that my dad would just get home. But my kids ain't never been hungry except when they were chasing the girl. And that was several times until they got, they finally got caught down the altar. This generation will not tolerate what we did as a kid in the Depression. That was another stupid Republican. His name was Hoover. <laughs> and again, we were misled. Again, we got told, don't let, don't like the Catholic, you remember that? Don't like the Catholic, you'll have the Pope running your business. Well, the Pope couldn't have screwed it up like Hoover did, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> At least if he had them, he at least gave us a prayer, which is more than we got out of that joke. <laughs> we got to feeling good and hungry and everybody was working again. And we all got carried away. We voted for a great general. He may have been great on the battlefield, but in the White House he was an idiot. A rank idiot! May heaven forbid, he and I will meet again, was we both going to be where it's extremely warm. And, and don't laugh, you'll be there. We're all going to get together again. <laughs> I want to conclude my remarks by suggesting that what we need to do is send Brother Ford in the White House a telegram like so. Please vacate the White House because it's obvious you have no program for America. Thank you, good luck, and may the Lord go with you.
If you'll take amendment to that telegram and take your vice president with you, I'll second it. I'll second the amendment. Let me just say, I think we're rather fortunate. Hank's been down several times, and we, we really never have, uh, have taped one of Hank's speeches until today. But we got Hank's remarks on what he taped. Why don't you remember what happened to the last idiot that had all that tapes? <laughs> <laughs> Hank, if they retire me on $340,000 a year, you're going to have no right. <laughs> We taped this, though, and we've got Tom Sawyer's remarks, and uh, I was just thinking it might be nice if we could put this together for about a 30-minute presentation, and some of you'd like to have it at your local union meetings. What do you think of that idea? Uh, all right, it's time for us to go now. I'll try to do that. Johnny Walker is back there in the back, and uh, John, I don't know where you were in the room. I told everybody as they left here, to grab them a handful of those ERA pamphlets back there and to give every legislator and every senator one when they go over there today. And I think you want to just tell them, take plenty of them and carry them back home and give them out to the local unions too? That's right. That's, we have the box back here now. And we I, have some more that's over at the ERA office here in Rock. I understand we got 30,000 of these things and so you can have all you want. And the paper workers want you to get them because if they, if you use them all, they make some more paper and the printers can print some more leaflets and uh, the printers can install telephones and buy houses and, and clothes and everybody be back to work. So if you don't take them damn pamphlets, we ain't gonna put a marker back to work. All right, it's, it's one o'clock. The legislature is in session. They'll be there for about an hour and a half. Grab you a quick bite, go over there and talk to your legislator, make sure he comes back over here for the banquet tonight, make sure you put those six points that I gave you, repeal of the food tax, the better unemployment compensation, the agency shop, the public employee bill, minimum wage, talk to them about them, as Hank says, the squeaking wheel gets the grease, squeak like hell. I want the public employee union people back up front here again with me. Uh, A.E., are you still in here? Is that 111, room 111? The paper workers are gonna have a caucus that are here in room 111 at 4.30 p.m. The reception will be outside in the big hall, all up and down there at 6.15. The dinner will start at seven. There'll be a dance afterwards. Those of you who need extra tickets should check with the desk and we'll, we'll be back to start this. We're gonna have a good time tonight, but we came here for a legislative conference. Our job here is to contact those legislators and let them know. Now that blueprint for a better North Carolina, which is our legislative program, has already been sent to every member of that General Assembly. Make him dig it out, see what he did with it. See if he threw it in the waste paper basket when he got it. Tell him that you're over there to support that program, that blueprint for a better North Carolina, and talk to him in particular about those six pieces of legislation I talked about in the morning. I saw Walter Stein. Is Walter still in here? I just want to, if he is, recognize him. Walter Stein, who's a field representative for the uh, trade union, American Trade Union Council for History Duck, was down and spoke to our luncheon of the executive board and advisory council yesterday. There's no further business in. The meeting is adjourned until 6.15 for the reception and 7 o'clock for the banquet. All public employee people up front, please. Don't forget that J.W. Giles of Osha will be in the back if any of you have any problems or discussions you want to have on Osha.
Yes, they do. Yeah. Stem winder. Great climax. Chris Scott back there in the back. I want all CLU presidents to be in this little meeting we got up here with the public employees, if you will. Hey, Wilbur, what was that fourth, uh, fifth, sixth resolution? Do you remember? I got, I got first. Yeah, I'll give you a couple. All right, please. Are you talking about, to talk to them about over there today? Yeah, and uh, the resolution is we voted on, you know. Here are, here are the points locally here, the state points. Give me that back if you will. All right. You can have that committee. Yeah, we're supposed to. I guess we'll have them in room four or six. I don't know yet. I don't know where John. I saw John come in back there one time today. I don't know what situation. Yeah, we got them. I don't know where any of them here today. Okay. I'm just trying to get an idea. We, John, we got 10,000 AFGE members in the state, <coughs> roughly 4,500 postal workers union, about 35 national letter carriers, about 600 teachers, about 1,400 firefighters. Uh, who else is here? Laborers have probably got, I don't know what they got. They, they ain't got, they got all the mail handlers. They got 1,300 and they're not affiliated with us, so I don't know. And Bob's doing work in the hospitals and all right now. Aspie's got uh, about 250 in the city of Durham, 700 at Duke University, and they're organizing the hospital. Transit are quasi-public right. employees right. right now, right. and they got uh, several hundred in this state here. Uh, postal workers are affiliated on the statewide with us. We've got state ports authority, which are the only state employees. And maybe you heard me say this morning. The RLA, yeah, the ILA, RLA. Uh, who else have we got here? I've asked the central bodies to sit in here with us because I'm going to ask you to do something when, when John gets through talking with us. Okay. Uh, most, if not all, of the unions are represented here are affiliated with the public employee plot. It was created last November in recognition of the growing importance and influence of the public service sector of the trade union movement. So we're only uh, four months old. The department has not yet geared up for its full cycle of activity. This is my secretary. 
very shortly we will have a legislative person on board, uh, a research uh, function, and a publications and uh, public relations operation. This is all that's contemplated for the current uh, budget year. As time goes on, it's very obvious that there will have to be an expansion that's all. Uh, of all of these activities. What I want to, uh, I, I should mention just a little bit about the structure. As with most other AFL CIO components, we have two elected uh, officers who are presidents of their own unions and are not paid by the public employee department. Holly McClendon of the firefighters is the president of the department, and Clyde Weber of the American Federation of Government Employees is the uh, treasurer. There is an executive board that uh, consists of the president or a principal officer of each of the affiliated unions. And uh, there is an administrative committee within that executive board that is overseeing the day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month operations of the department as we move from a fledgling operation into our uh, childhood and, and mature uh, more and months ahead. But what I really wanted to uh, talk to you about is to give you just a bird's eye view of the things that we're involved in at the moment. Remembering, of course, that we are limited right now because of the very small staff that we have. And I suppose these center almost exclusively on the legislative front. Uh, legislation has been the lifeblood of uh, working conditions and benefits for postal and federal workers uh, since the last, the last part of the last century. More and more, the interests of state and local government workers is involved in national legislation as well. Let me share this as an example. Just one example. So that the activity at the national level, legislation alone, uh, is increasing at a very marked rate despite the fact that the uh, postal workers uh, four years ago gained the right to bargain on almost all of their conditions of employment. Let me start first with the state and local uh, government employees. Last week, uh, President McClellan uh, testified on the Public Service Jobs Bill, known as the acronym, acronym is CETA in Washington. Uh, reciting some of the <coughs> problems that the public service unions are encountering in the communities where public service jobs, uh, a few public service jobs are made available, the matter of uh, the threats to career employees uh, or firing career employees and hiring CETA workers, public service job workers, or firing career workers and rehiring them as public service workers next month or so, uh, the inadequacy of the funds that are being granted to the communities and the unreliability of the unemployment statistics on which those funds are based. Uh, in line with the action of the AFL-CIO General Board, the department is advocating $9 billion public service jobs program. Uh, part of which will fund the operation for the remainder of this fiscal year, and part of which will create uh, an addition, an additional million jobs. Tomorrow morning, I am scheduled to testify before the House Post Office and Civil Service Committee on the Intergovernmental Personnel Act, uh, an act in brief that uh, is supposed to provide for an interchange of state and local government workers and federal workers to improve personnel administration. And in that testimony, we're going to insist that uh, trade unions be uh, able to acquire grants under this Intergovernmental Personnel Act. We're going to insist that collective bargaining by state and local workers be recognized as a, uh, as a part of the, of the legislation itself. And we're going to insist that labor be given an equal voice 
in the advisory council to this program. Now remember, this is, this is a program that's already in existence. We're also going to uh, ask the Congress to, uh, to continue the 75% matching funds that the federal government can allocate uh, to, the, uh, to the grantees uh, for this program for upgrading uh, personnel, uh, personnel administration. I mentioned uh, revenue sharing. This is a, another matter that has become extremely important to those who work in the state and local governments because of the projects that it uh, generates, the work that it generates, the level of public service that it can maintain uh, in the local jurisdiction. Well, these are just three of the items with which we're concerned at the moment. Looking ahead, we have the matter of unemployment compensation. As you know, uh, public uh, employees, state and local government employees, for the first time became eligible for unemployment compensation uh, through an act passed last year. Now, that act expires. That portion of the act expires at the end of 1975. And we're going to insist, particularly in this uh, era of unemployment, that it be extended to uh, state and local government employees uh, permanently. Federal workers have been covered by unemployment compensation for 20 years, federal and postal workers. Workman's compensation, and I might add that all these programs are, in, uh, are being pursued in tandem with the AFL-CIO. This isn't something that uh, we've just dreamed up separate and apart. Even in the national programs, we have a special interest in the public sector, but working closely with the AFL-CIO. Workman's compensation, the need for uh, the need for minimum standards for workman's compensation. I was amazed to find, uh, to have the uh, AFT official, American Federation of Teachers official, tell me in Washington a couple weeks ago that in the state of Illinois, uh, teachers do not are not uh, covered by the State Workman's Compensation Act. This just came as a, as a startling uh, piece of news to me. So there's a need for upgrading workman's compensation and making sure that there is universal uh, coverage. Let me move to the uh, federal side for just a moment. Here we have uh, something that I think is, is you people in the state and local services can be quite proud of pioneering for those in the federal service. And that is the liberalization of the Hatch Act. You'll recall that last year's uh, Election Reform Act freed state and local government employees to almost uh, a total extent from the restrictions of the federal Hatch Act. I'm not talking about the state and local little Hatch Acts yet. I'm talking about the federal Hatch Act. And this, of course, has established a good precedent so that we're going to be pressing for, pressing for uh, liberalization of the Hatch Act with respect to federal and postal workers. Uh, there has been underway for two or three years now a serious effort to secure the enactment of legislation providing for collective bargaining for federal workers uh, as distinguished from postal workers who are already possess it. We've been pressing that very hard as well. And let me just add this little footnote. One of the uh, legislators whom uh, your state organization endorsed plays a very keen role in these federal and postal employee matters because uh, Congressman Dave Henderson is the chairman of the Post Office and Civil Service Committee, which has jurisdiction over federal and uh, and postal worker legislation, and incidentally, this Intergovernmental Personnel Act that I happened to mention, that I mentioned earlier. So uh, we're, we're looking forward, uh, we hope, to uh, cooperation on the part of uh, Congressman Henderson. Uh, we hope that uh, it's going to generate some good legislation out of that, uh, that post office and civil service, post office and civil service. <coughs> Finally, on the federal end, we have the Ford program to clamp a lid 
on salaries, annuities, and Social Security benefits for private and public workers. More especially our interest is the 5% ceiling that Ford wants to impose on uh, federal salaries uh, and wages for blue-collar workers and for retired uh, federal employees. And we're going to be pursuing this with, with great vigor. The uh, general board and the executive council both address themselves to this problem. Now, let me then move quickly to the uh, postal service. As I mentioned, the postal workers have uh, had uh, almost uh, complete uh, collective bargaining uh, since 1970, since the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970. As a matter of fact, the uh, negotiations for a new national contract uh, will begin April 21st. Uh, I rather suspect that the uh, postal unions <coughs> uh, anticipate that the going is going to be a little rougher this time than it has been in the last uh, two contracts, especially the last, uh, the last uh, round of bargaining sessions. But in any case, they've advanced to the point where their collective bargaining rights are well established. And so we're supporting the postal unions in uh, their efforts to uh, secure the right to strike under certain limitations and certain conditions and uh, for the agency shop, I'm sorry, to, to bargain union security arrangements. These are two uh, areas that, at the time the original act was, was passed, a system uh, of uh, impasse settlement, conciliation and mediation, and strike, patterned largely as the <coughs> Canadian system for their national government work. The union security issue was fought uh, when the act was first uh, debated in the House and Senate, the climate then was, uh, was not good, and so uh, the unions were forced to accept uh, the right to work concept uh, of no security arrangements. Well, this in brief then is, the, is a, a very small view of what we're involved in at the present time on the legislative front. Uh, as time goes on, I hope very much that we're going to be able to supplement our activities, not just in legislation, but to try to pull together, for example, in the field of research, just what is this whole vast uh, panorama that we have in the field of collective bargaining involving the three segments, postal, federal, and state and local. Postal we know pretty well, it's one kind. Federal, we have a pretty good handle on because the Civil Service Commission generates out of its computers some contract analysis data. The state and local uh, fields where we have, I suppose, thousands of contracts, some of which I'm sure are very, very fine contracts, some I'm sure are very poor, we have no handle on it. And I think it would be a, a good mission for our department, when, once we have a research capability on board, to try to pull that together so that we can we can disperse this information to our affiliated unions for their, for their information. Well, that's about the size that I've talked uh, long enough. I'd sure would like to have uh, your reactions. I'd like to get a, a, a grasp of the problems that you're facing at the uh, state and local levels, and some of which uh, the state federation is covering very admirably, I'd say, uh, so that it'll help with my education, as I indicated in my Early remarks from the roster. That's about it. What chance do we have of collective bargaining? <clears throat> oh, I'm certainly glad. I, I, you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned it because I missed it. It's uh, a prime, uh, a prime uh, matter. Uh, we, meaning the unions involved, are now uh, sitting together, uh, trying, trying to cement the details of the collective bargaining bill. Congressman Thompson has reintroduced his earlier bill, H.R. 77, uh, providing NRA coverage for state and local government workers. Uh, the unions involved at the, uh, in the public employee department have now reached agreement on that. Now, that's it? the bill we're going to get. That's the bill we're going to support. And that's, uh, that's a position of the department, the unions associated with it. 
Bill, Bill with uh, the the Pennsylvania Department is trying to put together has not been introduced. 76, 77 was the bill, was the NRA bill of the previous Congress. It now has a new number, HR 77. Now, what, uh, what we're addressing ourselves to now in the state and local collective bargaining bill is such things as impasse resolution, cooling off periods, strikes, injunctions, status of supervisors. I think that it, it, it amounts to this. That the unions have reached agreement on a fundamental approach, which was the question of a separate authority versus the NLRA. Now we have to try to put the pieces together under that, that general approach that will satisfy the problems of all the unions involved. Uh, there, there is a note of urgency on the part of the House Education Labor Committee. The subcommittee wants to move, and we want to move as well. This again, by the way, we're doing in conjunction with the AFL-CIO, under the AFL-CIO's leadership. But we want to make sure that when we're ready to move, we have it all together. So that to the extent possible, we avoid uh, our unions are going to, uh, to uh, Congress with uh, differing uh, points of views on fundamentals. We might have enough of a problem with the right to work advocates and the conservatives in the uh, House and Senate. You know, without uh, hustling among ourselves back and forth. I certainly glad you raised it because it's a very important uh, part of our program. Any prognosis on these chances? I don't know. I think it's uh, a bit too well out. I've been around a little while and I've uh, tried to avoid uh, forecasting. Uh, I think the uh, prospects in both the House and Senate uh, labor committees are quite good. I think when we reach the floor of the House, at least the floor of the Senate, that's where the real struggle is going to occur, because the uh, anti-union forces will then be geared up quite well. And I just don't know, uh, you know, we can count, I'm sure, on the uh, opposition uh, of the uh, <coughs> Governor's Conference and the League of Cities, you know, and the organizations of the League of Counties, the organizations of that kind, and plus the right to work people in the business community. So I just uh, can't give you a quick, fast answer. But from the committees, I think we can address the bill pretty fast once we can reach an understanding about the basics. John, let me ask you a question. <coughs> We're going to have an opportunity during the Easter recess maybe to buttonhole these congressmen. And, you know, I think our chances of getting us some good legislation is much better in Congress than it is in this state legislature. I wonder if the bill is going to be introduced and if it can be speeded up so that we can take advantage of the time they're home during Easter to set up committees to call on every one of these congressmen about that bill. Well, Wilbur, the, the present strategy is not to have a separate bill introduced on behalf of the AFL-CIO and Public Employee Department. The present strategy is to try to resolve these issues that I just mentioned. Uh, reach agreement with them to go with the bill, H.R. 77, and then to amend H.R. 70, use that as the vehicle for amendment. Now, what I think, it really doesn't matter whether you title it a bill or not, I think what you're asking is whether we're going to have something together uh, by the Easter recess so that you can talk to the uh, members of the House and Senate delegation when they return. And I think that's a very good prospect and we'll be glad to share it. Uh, Why don't you try to get us, you know, the proposed amendments that you think are going to go to H.R. 77 so I can get it out and we can set up delegations from all these unions to get together and just have a sit down with the congressman. I understand, you know, that the, the other groups are beginning to get activated a little bit on this kind of thing and that some of our people are getting pressures from county commission organizations that we elected. In fact, you know, we had a uh, conference with the transit workers and Walter Beer Wagon. Yes, sure. Walter came in and he told us, you know, that some of the people that we really elected are beginning to crawfish a little bit, and so we need to, to get right on them on this stuff. So if you'll get me that information, I'll make sure that we have uh, at least a congressman that we got an opportunity 
We'll have the central bodies meet with them one time and have the federal employee committee or the government employee committee meet with them and maybe we'll get them into about three meetings during the Easter recess and, and they'll see that we're snowballing. Maybe we, maybe we get the postal workers to meet with them together and then we'll get the state and local government people to meet with them and then the AFGE and the central body people to meet with them. If we hit them with about four meetings during that recess and they'll know we mean business on it. Like, like we hitting, might get hitting some, the old mule with the board. Huh? That's right. <laughs> we'll get their attention. All right, any questions of what John said? All right, let me say that uh, There's a question. Uh, oh, Donnie Perry is president of state firefighters. Well, I think that's I think that's in the future. Now, I don't know about the year. Future, I want to be honest with you. I don't think it's in the near future. They're operating on the two cents per capita. Uh, most of the other departments in the AFL-CIO now have a four or five. So that uh, the leaders of the department are going to be conservative, particularly with a new operation like this, are going to be conservative. And then I think maybe a year or two from now, we'll take a look at the field operation and see how we can best serve, whether we can, whether we should operate through state federations and provide staff there, whether we should uh, establish uh, public employee councils. Uh, but I don't see that happening in the, uh, in the uh, few months ahead because we're budgeted for only these, well, about 10 jobs. One, two, three, four staff and the support personnel. I'd like to say I think in the South, in particular, this is where your greatest need for field representatives to help coordinate a lot, a lot of these efforts by you know, individual associations. And by the way, the South is also one of the great growth areas uh, in, uh, in the public service uh, organizations. No. Right. Right. We got the greatest potential for the labor movement in this country right here in this state. We got, we're the ninth largest industrial state in the union. Uh, I think the 11th largest state in the country. And uh, we've got 7.5% uh, of the workforce organized, and 92.5% out there needs to be organized. And uh, I think somebody needs to do this, uh, needs to know, John, we're getting a lot of, we, we understand what the problem is, and that we don't have public employee law in the state. And we understand, you know, they're making much greater gains everywhere else. But I think somewhere at one of these meetings, somebody needs to say that he's, these big people that we need some some people servicing down here because we can't organize if we don't have anybody come in and I've had complaints since I eat breakfast this morning about representatives scheduling themselves in here and not coming you know and the people are not getting service from the international and and they need service now I'm, you know I know they got a lot to do just like yeah, I got to yeah, do and yeah. they probably like me I want to do everything everybody wants me to do and and working 100 hours, I don't give it about 20% of it. Though. Sure. But, uh, well, I'd be happy to uh, convey that uh, to our administrative committee, that, that general sense of uh, wanting some more uh, service from the internationals uh, into, this, into this level. Uh, the AFG had a regional conference down here Friday, and they had a good conference, and they had they laid it on the line for their people to join with us and support our programs on this thing. And, I guess for the fact they had a four-day conference down there, probably some of them were not not here at this conference because of that. But uh, that's that. Let me try to run through. I got about 20 minutes worth of business. All right, any more questions to John? I'm sorry. Any more questions to John? All right, let me go through what I think we need to do here today. One, I think we ought to, we've got the federal employee groups here, which I established a permanent committee within the AFL CIO three years ago on this, and we've been working with them. We've got the local government uh, people here, local and state government people who are in this meeting. I think we ought to sort of merge these two groups together and just officially form a department like John's got. And maybe when we have a convention that we can get together for a half a day or an hour or two hours at our conferences and conventions and go over this stuff. So unless there's some objection, I'm going to consider the Federal Employee Committee and the state and local government uh, people as a North Carolina Department of Public Employees, comma, AFL-CIO. Any objection? 
That's one. Now we've got a committee, a federal employee committee. The other one we'll set up is a subcommittee of the department, which will be a, a committee on state and local government employees. We'll have to call you again to get some of this stuff. We've been meeting around, as most of you know, which is another part of the main reason we're here. <laughs> We've drawn up, but we haven't, we haven't got our public employee bill introduced yet. And we're fighting to get that bill introduced. We've got it into the computer, and we got it drafted here. Uh, and we've got about 15 or 20 copies of the draft here <coughs> that a committee worked on for a while in Winston-Salem, and then they met down here the other Monday night before the General Assembly went in session, completed drafting the bill, and I've gone on and had it put in the computer and <coughs> was trying to get to see Mike Neal Smith because I thought he would be the ideal man to introduce it. <coughs> but back, Mac, I think, has got so many fish that he's trying to fry. He's got this anomalous public utility bill. He's got the, the tax reform measures that he doesn't want to take on another big project. And uh, he got ambition. I don't know where he wants to incur the wrath of the League of Municipalities in particular. He has said he will speak for the bill in the committee and vote for the bill in the committee and vote for the bill. But I don't think he wants to be out here really being the champion that we're looking for. So what we've got to do, and what I wanted you to do now, and the reason I asked the central body presidents to sit in, uh, is we want to get this bill introduced in the Senate. We want to get it into the Judiciary Two Committee. And I'll give you the names of those committees uh, right here. The chairman of the committee is Luther Britt. And he's not going to particularly be for us, uh, Jim, Barton. Luther Britt's chairman of this committee, we want to put this public employee bill in, and he's from Lumberton. Uh, we don't have a central body in Lumberton, but Jim's president of the Federal Central Labor Union, and he's here with us today. Uh, so <coughs> Luther Britt is chairman. I don't know where we even really want to put much pressure on Luther today, because I think what we ought to do is get these other members of this committee committed before you know he knows what we're doing. Uh, uh, Weaver, we, uh, the vice chairman of this committee is Cecil Hill. Now, we ought to have Cecil, and I mean, let's, let's put the muscle on Cecil on this damn thing. Cecil Hill is vice chairman, and let's get Cecil. The committee is made up of 13 people. The magic number to get it out of the committee is seven. <coughs> and we got seven votes on that. There's no reason that this bill ought not be introduced and gotten out of the committee. Uh, we really, I don't believe, going to get a real heavyweight to be the champion and the floor leader of it. I don't know yet who we get, but we got some good folks that, on this committee that will probably do it. And let me go through the committee with you and explain to you, and then we're going to give you copies of the bill. And we want you to divide up into little subcommittees. We want certain ones of you to target a certain representative. Uh, the committee is Luther Britt chairman and he's from Lumberton and I say today let's just forget Luther let me handle him a little bit later I get along with him pretty good he's conservative and we ain't got no unions to pressure him down there maybe I'll have to get my lumbees on him <laughs> they do a pretty good job you can ask Gus Spiros Cecil Hill uh, we got to have the the Asheville the Waynesville Haywood County and the paper workers from Brevard on Cecil uh, so we want them. I see Crawford is from Buncombe County. Anybody in here from Buncombe? I don't see John Jervis. I think probably we can get I see, but uh, nobody here from him. You better let me handle that one. Uh, I'm counting Cecil as a vote, and I'm counting I see as a vote. The next man on the committee uh, and the president. Of, how many people here from Winston Salem? Hold up your hand. Lawrence Davis is on the committee, but uh, I'm not counting Lawrence as one of the votes we, we got, and we got enough without Lawrence, but you ought to go see Lawrence and keep the pressure to it on the committee, but Lawrence is on the committee, John Newman here is the president of Central Labor Union, we got teachers here, we got uh, postal workers here, go see him and talk to him about it. Russell Kirby's on the committee, Slim. I think maybe you ought to wait and me and you get with Russell a little bit later. I don't want him to get too much knowledge of what we're doing right off the bat. Murray Odom, 
Anybody here from Laurenburg, Scotland County, Scotland, and Stanley, and this is an area where we don't have many, but Mary Odom is a teacher. Mary Odom, we supported Mary. Uh, she, she might vote for us. I'm not counting her. I'm putting her as a question mark. But she might vote for us. If any of you know her, all right, go see her. If you don't, leave that to me and let me work with that. That might still work. Yeah. Right around uh, we got a real sensitive thing. It's picking it up with the background music. If I start swaying, you all know it. I'm with it. Yeah. The next one is Greensboro. How many from Greensboro? Got two people on the committee from Greensboro. Both of them ought to vote for the bill. Catherine Sebo, and we may have to get Katie to introduce the bill, and McNeil Smith. So both of these you ought to go see. And I don't know whether if we got that many from Greensboro, we ought not divide up into two groups and let two groups go hit Catherine Sebo. She shouldn't be any problem. I, she ought to be all right, and Mac ought to be all right. Uh, Wilmington, who's here from Wilmington? Bill Smith thought to uh, ought to vote for the bill. Bill managed my campaign for governor down there. And he's a lawyer. He got that much damn guts and can then get elected. Bill will vote for the bill. I think I'm counting Bill Smith, but I want to get with A.E. and them and carry. It. I'm counting Bill Smith from Wilmington. Uh, the next guy is Tom Strickland from Goldsboro. Anybody from Wayne County? I think maybe we ought to let me handle Tom too. He's I'm not counting him. I might can, he's running for governor and I might can, uh, you know, shut him up or let him have kidney trouble or something. So uh, let me handle Tom. Uh, Charles Vickers from Chapel Hill. Go by and say hello to Charlie, all of you. Eight or 10 of you, go by and say hello. Charlie Vickery will vote for our legislation, no problem, good man. I'd get him from Chapel Hill, but we don't have any central body. But some of you go by and see Charles Vickery. Bill Richard from Durham, and uh, Richard, I guess I'll have to get with you on Bill Richard. Bill may want to try to slip out from under us on this one, but I'm counting him. We'll have to get him on this one. And the next one, John Winters from Raleigh. No problem. All right. Uh, we've, uh, we've got, I've counted, the ones I'm counting is Cecil Hill, I C Crawford, Murray Odom's question, Catherine Sebo, I'm counting, McNeil Smith, I'm counting, Bill Smith, I'm counting, Charles Vickery, I'm counting, Willis Richard, I'm counting, John Winters, I'm counting, I'm counting eight votes and we need seven. We can lose one of those and still get it out of the committee if everybody's present and the others are all against us. So we got a good bill. Now we've got the bill as I said and it's drafted. I don't know how many copies of it I got here. But I guess what I really want to do now <clears throat> is I want you to take the bill and go around and talk to them about it. And I want you to get them to commit it to sign the bill. Uh, in fact, if you will, get them to sign this copy of the bill. And that'll mean that they'll sign the copy. And then when I get them all back from you to know who said they would sign it, I'll go around and get them all to sign it before we put it in. Now don't, you know, don't go blowing your information to everybody and get all our opposition. You people going to see Lawrence Davis, and don't tell him what we're doing. Just tell him we'd like for him to introduce the bill uh, or would like for him to support the bill. This is the draft and all. Because what I really got to do is go twist the Lieutenant Governor's arm right now to make sure he puts it in this damn committee. And then that'll give us a month or so to work on the rest of the Senate, which all we need is 26 people, and we got a good chance of getting them. But this is a, a, a real good committee. There ain't no, there ain't no real anti-robbery of Jesse Helms type conservatives on this committee. Uh, there are two or three, you know, who are business people, but they, uh, they also got a little intelligence, and they're very cordial to me. So I think I can probably talk to all of them, and while some of them may bend to the league's pressure, uh, I don't think we're going to find no real hard fight uh, that gets bitter against us on it if we get it in there and then. 
And like we, like I said, we could get eight of these people, these eight that I'm talking about, to agree to sign the bill before we put it in. And I really don't know who I want to put it in yet. You know, I, I don't think we'd have any any problem with Catherine Sebo about getting her to, to introduce the bill, and Charles Vickery would introduce the bill, and Bill Smith, I think, will introduce the bill if I talk to him. But Bill done got over there, and he's like me. He's a loudmouth maverick, and Bill done made about half of them mad, and I, I don't know where he's the best man to introduce the bill. He's our kind of folks, but, you know, the, the ultimate goal is to get the bill passed. And so uh, I've got to kind of make a little decision along those kind of lines, whether or not who we ought to get to introduce the bill. I, I sort of sort of believe maybe, you know, if we get to, uh, might want Catherine Sebo to introduce the bill. And uh, that, of course, helps with Mac uh, as well. But is there any questions on what I've said? Well, I went by and talked to Jim last Friday, but he was busy with some other things, and I told him, well, I'll take up three or four minutes of your time, and I'll be by to see you the first of the week on it. Take the bill and look at it. I had it typed up and gave him a copy of it, and this was before I put it in the computer. But uh, I, I don't think I'm going to have any problem, but I don't think y'all ought to go over there and tell everybody that Jim's committed to put it in this committee. Uh, well, he's got this committee appointed to put anything he wants liberal into and get it out of there. You know. All right. Any questions on what I'm saying? We're going to give you. Let let me let me uh, let me call the groups off again. I'm going to take Luther, so nobody bother Luther. Uh, Weaver, will you come up and get uh, a copy of the bill, and, and I'm going to leave Cecil up to you. You're in charge of Cecil. Now, any of y'all got any public employees? Weaver's from Waynesville. It's a little town. I know Doris Bishop's husband's a postal worker up there. She's here, but Lana's not here, is he? No, Doris is here. Doris will go with you. But any of you that have any, this is all the western counties outside of Asheville. They cover everything to the, to the Tennessee line, don't they? And we've got two senators, and I don't think we're going to have any trouble with either one of them voting for the bill. If we do, we'll put Republicans back in next time, tell them we've... <laughs> I'd say if we do, we'll have Republicans back next time, tell them. All right. I see Crawford. Nobody here from Asheville, is there? I'll have to get with John Jervis, and I'll take that one. Uh, I guess y'all probably, I can give Winston-Salem about three copies of the bill. Uh, you and John and, and Winston-Salem people get together. And John, you and Harry, I'll, I'll look for y'all to come back with me with the information on Winston. I'll, I'll try to handle Russell Kirby with me and Slim. And Slim, you want a copy of the bill to be looking at? Now, one thing I need to say about this bill, and we got a kind of a, what do you call it in there? I'm going to call it a kicker for a better word right now. We've taken the prohibition on the right to strike out of the bill. We have said back in the back part of the bill, if you have a contract that you get binding arbitration and you can't strike, and somebody says, well, you ain't got the right, you ain't got no prohibition on right to strike. If you want to show them that part back there that says you can't strike because you got arbitration, okay, if you got a contract. But to get the bill, you know, you can strike to get the contract the way we got the bill written. But I don't think you ought to tell everybody that unless somebody says, well, there ain't no right to strike in here, and that's one of the keys he wants in there. Then you point to that thing back there in the back and uh, just explain to him here, it says you don't strike, you have binding arbitration. But you can strike for the contract if we can flip it through like this, you understand? You don't have to broadcast that again. Don't tell all these people over there. That's a little secret treat. <coughs> I'll handle Murray Odom, and I'll give about I'll take one for Odom. six. Uh, all right, I got. Let me. Let's say. Let's. How many people again from Greensboro? 
All right, let's divide up this way. Let's divide up the postal workers go in one, and uh, the rest of the uh, Greensboro people go in. Again, we got teachers, laborers, and bus drivers. Who else? And postal workers. That's all we got. How many postal workers we got? We got three, and Jim Adams is somewhere as four. All right, let me give y'all three copies of this bill, each group. Bob, you want to handle one group, y'all? Is that three there? Call it two. All right. Now y'all go, the Greensboro group goes to see both Catherine Sebo and McNeil Smith, understand? All right, then that brings us down to Bill Smith, and we got nobody in here from <coughs> Wilmington, right? Um, I'll get with the central body, and I'll take care of Smith, too. I kept saying I'm going to turn some of his work over to somebody else. Damn, I ain't taking it back right back off. Tom Strickland, we're going to leave alone for a little while, and I'll see him. Charles Vickery, those of you that can, take a few minutes, go by, and just speak to him about the public employee bill and tell him you hope he'll, he'll have our support on it, that it's introduced by the state FLCIO. Just let him know you're concerned about it. He'll be all right. But we don't have any union people over there. It's a college town where, you know, and we did right well. But Charles will be with us, no doubt. Bill Richard, we got how many from Durham? We got, we got the city workers over here, Richard, from Durham, too here. Richard cares some of our black brothers in because, you know, Bill got the black vote to put him in the Senate now. So, Carol Preston Edwards and a couple of those in with you, and then I'll see, I'll see uh, Bill myself later. We might get Durham people and divide up into two groups, too, and hit Bill with two different groups. Here are three copies of the bill for Durham. Next is Raleigh. How many people we got from Raleigh now? I think it'd be good if we divided Raleigh up into two groups. Uh, Donnie, why don't you take one group, and Bill, you take a group, uh, and go in. Uh, how many postal workers from Raleigh? Donnie, how many firefighters we got here today? Just you? Well, I was hoping you know we, we might, might could, uh, Let's let the postal workers go, and then, uh, and uh, Bill, you think you can explain the bill good enough with them? Well, I was going to let you go with a group and let Bill go with the postal workers. All right, well, let's, let's, we want them on the bill. We want them to sign the bill as it goes in. There's uh, three copies and three more. All right. All right, remember now, we got on the ones I'm sending you to see or the ones that I know gonna, will vote for the bill, we got eight votes out of 13. But we need all eight of them. If two of them waver, you know we're gone, unless we pick up somebody, and that's possible. But I think we can count on all eight of these people. So if you'll get them to commit themselves to sign the legislation, and if you will, tell them we're trying to get as many as we can and that some of the other people are working on them, and we expect to have, you know, uh, somewhere between uh, 10 and 15 people to sign the original bill. And I can get five or six more who's not in the committee to sign the bill before we put it in. All we need is 26. If we can get 15 or 20 on the bill, you know, that'll make us look good. Any questions? All right, go get them. John, I won't give you a copy of this just for your information. It's a draft right now, but that's the bill we're introducing. 
Hey, do you want us to go talk to the McMurray? So, yeah, I'm not good. Maybe you ought to take a bill, Bill, but you know, those of you that if you don't use these bills, bring them back. I've almost let all of them go out. And uh, when I go talk to these ones I'm going to talk to, I'm going to need a bill to leave with them. And so I, I really don't have enough for those people. But uh, any other counties that we, we got groups from here today, we got Mecklenburg here, and they're going to talk to Mecklenburg. Uh, well, we had Wilmington people. Y'all y'all need to, we probably, we probably, where did the, where did the Wilmington folks go? Y'all from more here too.